We're going to go over some of the pitches that were submitted by viewers like yourself, kind of give some honest feedback and a little bit of critique on how you can make them better. And then we'll talk about all kinds of other game stuff like your questions, how to finish a game, and some other interesting things that your eye came up with along the way. So welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming out here. Um, thanks for joining us. Please hit the thumbs up button, subscribe, and share the stream if you don't mind. And um, check the links down below for other interesting things. All right, so how's everybody doing this week? Great. <laughs> Everybody's as excited as me. It looks like we've got one more person coming on in. Let's see if I can hit the button. Oh, I can't fit Salim in this view. Sorry, Salim. There you go. Now you're in the Christmas tree. Oh, sorry. I stole Andrew's tree. I'm going to turn off the overlay. (laughs) Anyway, welcome, everybody. And hey, Salim, we're just getting started. We're going to go over a bunch of game dev submissions or game submissions that were put in since last week. We're going to give out a writer license with a new version of the Battler thing that I've been playing with that hopefully interacts with YouTube this time. So it'll be with people that are live in chat today. And... um. I don't know what else we're going to do today. Probably talk about other fun stuff. So, hello again <laughs> and welcome. So, where do you guys want to get started? Do you think we should dive straight into the reviews of these portfolio projects? Or do you have some other things that you think we should uh, jump into first? Any, any important big news going on this week or anything you guys want to share? Uh, Witcher 2 that. I like that. that. That was good. <laughs> Witcher? That, that was good. I'm still... I'm on episode seven now, so i to catch up. Anybody who hasn't seen it, it's out on Netflix, and season two just came out Friday. So it's definitely worth watching if you like RPGs and fantasy stuff. Uh, oh, that might actually be interesting to uh, mention as well. Uh, Final Fantasy VII is out on PC now on the Epic Game Store, and um, it's uh, using Square Enix's uh, proprietary uh, audio files. Uh, format and i've modded kingdom hearts free uh which also used the same format for audio to make a tool to extract and re-implement audio in it and somebody took my tool and used it on final fantasy 7 remake and it worked flawlessly out of the box and i didn't even know that was happening so that was really funny when someone said thank you <laughs> they're like oh nice nice. <laughs> nice anybody got anything else Dave, you look like you got something really right on the top of your mind there. Never. Uh, I'm always a blank. I don't know. Uh, this week, being more efficient. So smart profiles on Stream Deck. Finally got around to sorting out the smart profiles on the Stream Deck, which is awesome source. If anyone's got a Stream Deck, uh, smart profiles will basically enable that as soon as you tap on an application and bring it to focus, you can actually change the profile, all the keys on the Stream Deck to show hotkeys for that particular application uh which is awesome so i've been setting that up this week for unity premiere all the rest of it uh which is great um somebody who shall remain nameless always sends text messages and doesn't use discord or slack or anything like that yeah you're <laughs> laughing jason because it's you um and loves to send not, not me by the way I'm, I'm not a boomer no, anymore i no. actually use modern technology i'm pointing the wrong way i'm yeah. pointing that way no, that um, <laughs> and we'll always send yeah, links telegram. on that and it's such a nightmare uh so now i've set up your phone on windows uh, 10 to basically enable me to talk to my android phone which is awesome if you haven't used that it's great and then you can link it to your stream deck so when you get a notification you just press the button in your stream deck up comes your phone the application and you could do that so yeah lots of uh, efficiency stuff this week and getting the simulator running but i'm not going to show that today because i don't quite so finished. is that phone thing is that built into windows 10 or is that an app that you had to go download uh, it's one of the windows 10 apps you can get uh from windows themselves and it talks to your android phone and it's pretty sweet and that's the one called um, just your phone right it's got a really yeah, just, it's just basic called name your phone so it's like, like, yeah it's yeah. really annoying but um yeah it's really good uh, i've been using it with the, with android and loving it um so that's great uh put out another tutorial video this week um about uh reactive menus in unity <laughs> Uh, oh, okay. So, Some people struggle with, so. Yeah, so yeah. that's uh, that seems to be doing quite well. To be pretty honest, like I didn't even know you could set a checkbox on a menu item. That was new information there for me. There you go. 
I've spent far too much time in Unity. Yeah, so checkboxes in um, in your menu items, putting your menu items into different parts, like the project view, the inspector view, and being able to gray out menu items so to validate whether they should be shown or not shown. So that's in there, uh, and I'll put a link up in a minute for that. Nice. Yeah. Hello, lots of cool stuff. Is your YouTube channel growing pretty well then? It seems like you're up to, what, 500 subs already? No, I haven't yeah, reached 500. Um, as soon as I reach 500, I could do polls and ask people what tutorials they want next because I've got too many uploaded and not a clue which one to put up. So Everybody should go subscribe real quick so you can get to the polls and start creating more content and getting more stuff out there. I'm really excited to start working on some of the um, hardware integration stuff and, and kind yeah. of link up with you more on that. I've been sharing with Dave quite a bit privately a bunch of stuff that I've got on my floor text, ripped yeah. apart and... I th- I've got some plans to do some really cool stuff, um, game dev related with some hardware and link it all up in the background and stuff. It should be a lot of fun. Yeah, we'll do some filming around the house and uh, in the workshop with some of the stuff running. So it should be good. Yeah, I need a workshop. That's, I think that's the problem. Right now, my, my workshop is the, the rug on the other side of my desk. <laughs> I'm down there. And the first thing that I did was burn some wire. I saw it start melting right away. I was like, all right. I can't use this crappy little wire. I actually do need to get something else. So I've seen, I've it was a nice house, little please. melt right on the floor. I've seen your house. You got plenty of space for workshop somewhere. Well, I got a, too many kids for that. Though. I got to take over one of their rooms. Just like right. tell them it's their workshop too and, and let them have a little section in it. <laughs> your bedroom is now a workshop. <laughs> hey, you sleep in a workshop. <laughs> it might work for the five-year-old. Right? He'd be excited. It's like the Iron Man workshop in here. Just don't touch there you anything. Go. <laughs> My wife wandered into the garage one day and went, oh, so I suppose we're not having cars in here anymore because it's got a giant like workshop desk in there, massive 3D printers, paint booth, and all the rest. And I was like, yeah, no, the car's going to be outside. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who, who uses, who uses the benefit of living in cars? California. Yeah, who uses, yeah. That's the great thing about California as well. Bigger houses, bigger garages, and you can put loads of stuff in them. And your car doesn't need to go in it because it's not getting cold enough to matter. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> It yeah. definitely helps, yeah. Yeah, my wife's turned ours into a gym, so <laughs> I, I, I know the feeling. I empathize with your wife. <laughs> oh, we have, we, have a, we have a gym in the house. She uses that. She, well, uh, yeah, sorry, not a gym, a yoga room. Um, <laughs> which smells of incense all the time. I think it's incense. But you got to add know. some IoT projects in there. <laughs> IoT yeah, yoga. Already are. They're oh, already. I bet. <laughs> of course, there are. It's me. There's IoT. We we constantly go around the house speaking to it. Um, and when people come around to visit, they think we're crazy because everything is IoT and voice based. Yeah, that's the way to do it. I think mm. get everything controlled by Google, Alexa, or something else. Make it all oh, voice yeah. controlled. All right, you guys got anything else before we jump into these game pitches? Nope. I just want to rant that I just got a message from FedEx, which tells me that I'm being charged three hundred dollars for the delivery of my analog pocket. Thank you very much. So oh. there we go. Imports and duties that cost nearly twice what the fucking thing costs. So there we go. That's nice. <sighs> what? <sighs> yep. That's important duty for you. Yeah, the joy of living in the EU. Uh, what, what was the thing that, that you got that's got the three hundred dollar import? The, the analog pocket. On the plus side, they're selling for about eight or nine hundred now on eBay, so maybe it's worth my while just to sell the damn thing just to get the money back. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> wow! And can you tell everybody what that is? I, I'm pulling it up um, right now. But... It's, it's the ultimate Game Boy. It's basically uh, there, there's a lot of emulation machines out there and various other ways to play Game Boy games, and you either want to refurb an old Game Boy and replace it with like an AES screen or something. Uh, But this is like a new piece of hardware that's built to be the best possible way to play retro games effectively. Uh, It doesn't emulate. You actually have to provide your own games, which is fine because I have them behind me. And uh, yeah, and you you can effectively play the original Game Boy games on it. The screen resolution is 10 times the original Game Boy and the speaker's great on it. And you've got mod pack plugins so you can put in things like the uh, Atari Lynx and other stuff. It also works as like, you know, you can use it as a as a DAW and everything else. It, it, it's pretty cool. It's effectively like a really shiny, fancy Game Boy. It's it's probably far too expensive, but then again, uh, for someone who actually plays retro games, one of these and a uh, one of the various different cartridges that lets me use some ROMs on it as well. Great combination. 
Are you I just a, got rid of all my Game, Game Boy Go? games like three or four months ago. Oh, well. Oh, that is a tidy bit of kit. Yeah, it's very nice. Nice little stand and everything. One small annoyance is they have a white model and a black base. They don't have a white base. What are you doing? Oh, <laughs> no. Yeah, so come on. You're kind of you're limited then, the, which one you're getting. Um, yeah, as for the import, apparently it's like 100 and something for tax and then 100 for other. Won't even tell me what it is that I'm paying the extra 100 <laughs> and something for. Oh, there's all so, that sneakers yeah. kit. They, got, they, they uh, wrap with it all the, you know, all the drugs and stuff they come across. <laughs> you have to pay the import tax for the mafia. <laughs> no, that's a really nice design. Yeah, clean Thing is is great. Yeah. It looks nice. I agree. Are you gonna get a, a Polymega, uh, Jason? I don't know. I I have so many. I already have like, I think I have somewhere in the realm of like fifteen mobile consoles, various different things, yeah. and then as far as other consoles go. I've got the um, mini Famicom with, I've got that modded. I've got a modded Xbox. A mod, I have so many consoles now at this stage. I have to figure out which ones I actually want to use because <laughs> it gets to the point that some of them are just for, for having and some of them are for playing. Like I have a, a Atari Junior back there that I'll never play. Like oh, it's wow. a tediously horrible console to play, but it's cool. It looks very visually impressive and I did play it as a kid. So uh, yeah, I, I'm trying to stick now to consoles I actually play. <laughs> and so I have my, my modded N64, my modded Xbox and... Um, I'm now getting the Game Boy. So I think that's what I'll stick with for a while until I actually get back through some of my backlog of games. Um, so here's an interesting question regarding that. The old Game Boys um, had limited ability to play multiplayer because of all the, uh, you know, no internet. You had to connect it with uh, cable and pray yeah, that apparently, it the, apparently this one has support for the link cable, so you can, in fact, play with an original Game Boy with your new one as well. Which yeah. is cool. oh, oh, wow. <laughs> That's Although awesome. I don't think I don't I think it it can't you can't play it on a GameCube you can't do the Link stuff GameCube I think it's the only like thing that they weren't able to to add to it. Yeah, makes me wonder. I remember trying to emulate the multiplayer online, and that was uh, kind of a special hell because some of these games were set up in such a way that if they don't get the information within like zero point one seconds of the latest pay, uh, packet, they will straight up say you disconnected and they will drop the entire multiplayer operation. <laughs> uh, so trying to play even something basic like a turn-based game with two sides online uh, didn't work as well. And what's this thing, Salim? Uh, Polymega. It's it's basically like a console that's going to be able to play um, uh, I think four or five different consoles original cartridges and stuff you can just like swap out uh, uh different adapters and shit like that um if, if you're not familiar with this one the other examples are like the right the retron or the whole retron series is very similar in terms yeah. of, of what they were doing um but it's like really stylish and and like all the controllers and stuff are pretty sleek um someone bought me one for uh christmas last year and i'm still waiting like it, they've been on crazy pre-order i think they're supposed to drop like middle of uh, next year, they're gonna start sending them out. But they keep like releasing extra attachments. They're adding to support more consoles. Um, but it's a nifty little system. Um, I'm pretty excited to get one because I have the the one caveat though. A lot of these virtualized console things depends on what you're trying to play. Uh, the N64, for people who don't know, is one of the most universally hardest thing to get right modern yes. day playing games on. Yes, because it capped out at 480. So it absolutely, genuinely looks horrible on modern televisions. And there's a whole load of different things you have to do. And, and it didn't have support for a lot of the older standards. And so, funnily enough, you can get an easy, you can get a better analog signal out of a SNES than you can out of an N64 for various different reasons. And it's, it's just a nightmare. So depending on what you're doing, you have to really do your research if you're trying to get good quality looking N64 games. And so I, I haven't looked into specifically how they're handling it, but depends on whether they're using an original board. Sometimes you can cut an original, you can actually cut an original N64 board down to about that size and have it still function. But there's a lot of, yeah, it's it's a whole thing. You've seen the guy who made the um, Port of 164 it lasts Handhelds, like two yeah. hours or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, that thing's pretty cool looking. But that was obviously a labor of love because it didn't sound like fun putting that together. <laughs> no. 
All right, I think it's time we should probably jump on to taking a look at some of these game submissions. So we had three that came in before we started the show. Um, was there one that you guys wanted to look at and talk over first? Did you guys, I don't know if anybody had a preference. Salim, I don't know if you saw the folder full of the submissions. I'm looking at them now. Okay. Anybody have a preference on which one we pull up first and just kind of talk about? And the, the goal here for everybody watching is just kind of give some feedback on the pitch, um, things that we, questions that we have about it, um, feedback that we might have, just a- anything that we can do to kind of help you refine or make the pitch a little bit better is kind of the goal. I don't know if it's going to be great or actionable advice, but I guess we'll we'll try our best. <laughs> So game developer and not game features. <laughs> exactly. Each all, all the the three submissions, each one is very different from each other. So I would say take your pick, um, because they are so vastly different. There's you know, they have very, very is, different one presentation like, styles. One like stands out. It's obviously a, a group that's been together for what nine years, so theirs is way different than the other ones, which are like just one pagers. Um the fatherhood one, there's like a lot to digest there. Um, mm. Why don't we hit that one last then? Yeah. We'll start with the the other two are one page docs from what I remember. So here we go. I'll pop up the, let's start with this first one right here. Fairway evil. All right. <laughs> can everybody see it? And is it big enough? I don't know if I can make this bigger. But it looks like it's a uh, the evil golfing game. I guess we can read through the whole thing and um, just kind of... Urban evil and golf mixed together. That's what, that's what I'm seeing here. So I guess I'll, I'll read the game summary out loud for everybody who's just listening and not watching, and then we just kind of go through it and t- talk the thing out. So it says, after years of hard work, it's time for that big promotion to celebrate. Parasol is sending you to the Sacklers estate for some well-deserved rest it, and relaxation. Put motion into it, man. Come on. Before you move into your new corner office, there we go. When you arrive, nothing is as you expected. There we go. The estate is unkempt, managed by a strange steward. Your bosses are nowhere to be found. After a few rounds of golf, you bump into someone on the fairway. They appear grossly ill, moaning and wandering aimlessly. You reach out to help, and they suddenly attack. Following a brush with sudden death, you realize this island is no place to be, and you must escape by any means necessary. Will you survive to make par? So, you're escaping a golf course of zombies? All right. Um, so, you guys, I guess everybody's hopefully had some time to read over it all. Um, what do you guys think overall of this thing as a pitch? So, it looks like it's got a game summary, kind of giving the, the story, the outline there. Yeah. Um the key mechanics kind of just listed you got some sort of inventory um, merchants and crafting so here's yeah. something i want to say straight ahead the game summary did not tell you anything about what genre the game is except the last sentence which is will you survive to make par which is like we have a golf theme and there is an element of surviving be it means health or the classic survival of other mechanics but you don't even know that from what you read so uh I would say that I'd like a summary to tell me a bit more about, like, how would I imagine playing this? <laughs> my, my, my main bit of advice straight away is just, regardless of the game itself, there's two types of fonts. There's fonts that are designed to be used for headers and fonts that are designed to be used to be read in paragraphs. Yeah. These are fonts. And so you can, like, perfect example, Jason was reading that and he, like, stuttered and caught himself up a few times. That's not his fault. It's the fact that if you have all capitalized text font, people have trouble reading it because there's no um, there's no shape for you to keep your to catch your eye on to keep track of where you are. So never on anything you ever do, whenever you're doing any kind of text or pitching or presentations or posters or anything, have more than two lines of all capitalized text, um, and ideally less than that. But in specifically something like this, like try it yourself. If you squint your eyes, you'll have a hard time reading that. You see the shape of the whole block, you don't see the individual parts. But if you have lowercase text, it's far easier to keep track of where you are and read it. So always use normal casing when paragraphs. And if you have a lot of text, do consider making two paragraphs instead of one. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just, one thing that catches my eye outside, I'm, I might be jumping ahead, but I don't, one of the key gameplay mechanics is inventory management. 
um, which just seems like a weird gameplay mechanic to feature. Um, I'm not sure if there's something special there, but uh, I would get kind of hung up on that as like that sounds actually. If, if memory serves too, that's actually in the um, 30 things I hate about your game pitch. Literally, one of them yeah. is expressly no one cares about your inventory system <laughs> because every like literally that's ex- exactly a statement because everybody yeah. writes it as a feature when like <laughs> health bars is not a feature; it's a thing that games have, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so yeah. as a general rule, you want to yeah. you, you want your your feature list to demonstrate. Not what you added to the game, but what the game adds to a person playing it. Yeah. Like what is the what is the experience they'll have, you know? I think the same yeah. probably goes uh, for uh, it also listing to, merchant system, which is also like I'm not sure what that means or why would I get, to I put, would get excited about that. <laughs> to put a bit of a, a caveat in that statement about inventory management, he says to specifically not include that unless it's really unique. And given the resemblance we talked about at the start about uh, Resident Evil, these games actually do have a relatively unique inventory management system where you have limited space and you have to Tetris your inventory contents effectively. And um, that one, some people acted as if it's a mini game of its own. And there's like a ton of uh, shared... Uh, screenshots of people perfectly organizing their inventory or doing neat tricks with it, so might think, be think, includable. Yeah, that but. that's my interpretation. Is that hey, if if managing your inventory is decisions you make that affect the rest of the game, so I can't do both. I have to do this or that. I have to make a choice, and that's going to change what happens next. Then yeah, I think that's that's perhaps fair to to list as a mechanic because now it's impactful if it's just a cool trick or gimmick then you're right it's not impactful but i think it, i think ultimately that's implied by the fact that the target audience is survival horror which generally is survival horror inventory is kind of a key part of that and that's more exciting to say um than inventory management um yeah yeah right? like you, you can say the same thing but say it as like uh, choose carefully what you bring because you're limited. Like, limited. You, uh, yeah, like yeah. put something in that tells you what the, what the experience of that will be. You know, <clears throat> limited resources yeah. would have been better here. Also, merchant system is a bit less interesting than yeah, anything I don't else know here. What that means. Does it mean that I can sell stuff? Does it mean like people sell things in there? Do the zombies sell stuff? Like, I, it's a weird uh, thing to have in there. Um, it's not exciting ultimately. Like, if it just said. Shooting, golfing, puzzle solving, and crafting. That's a fine um, list of gameplay mechanics. It's pretty succinct, and all those are all things that that definitely would pique various people's interests. Um, and then you go into survival horror, um, casual. Like Both of those together would be fine, and it definitely implies the inventory aspect of it. Um, and then you have Resident Evil as an example, um, which would uh, further implies the notion of the uh, inventory. Um, <laughs> As well as Mario Golf, like telling you how the golf game might work with the running around and stuff like that. Um, so I think those two things probably don't need to get listed, and they just make it a little bit extra long. Um, at least that's that's how I see it. Uh, I do want to bring up, though. I know we've been tearing into this for a tiny bit already, but we are trying to help. This is we, we are not trying to uh, destroy anyone's confidence. Yeah, it's yeah, literally yeah. just attempts at tips and things that we see that could be portrayed better, yep. uh, ideally, to us. Um, uh, in fact, actually, so a bit of a, a plot twist here. Uh, I've played the demo for this. I know the guy who's making it. And um, it, what's interesting to me is, is approaching it with just a pitch in mind. I don't see the game that I played because, the, for example, the bit that I thought was most fun was that you, you basically can, you're running around a golf course, you can take out a golf club, you can like eat a, a golf ball directly at a zombie, hit him in the head, and then take out a, a AK forty seven and shoot him. Right? That's a that's a fun little game loop where you can do kind of interesting stuff. Oh, there's guns but in I there don't too. I don't get any of that from from the pitch I'm seeing. Right? Like there's no indication of what the gameplay is. So it's just one of those things where the the pitch really needs to sell you on what your experience of playing the game is going to be. And to me, the idea that you can treat golf as a weapon effectively is a fun part of this that's not really covered. You know. Yeah, I, I, you saying there's an AK-47 is surprised because I was assuming this was all just like various uh, golf clubs and stuff as weapons that you'd modify and it'd be all melee based or like using the golf club, like explosive golf golf balls and stuff like that. That's how I would, I wouldn't imagine ever pulling out a gun. Um, based on this, it seems weird that you pull out a gun. Um, 
it seems like keeping I, it all for a gun to the golf would course be, would be great. I, I, I do want to bring up that the first word in the key gameplay mechanics is shooting, but because oh, the notion yeah. is that you are talking about golf, people yeah, which yeah. imply yeah. shooting that golf balls. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's where um, when you when you list your mechanics in these sort of pitch documents, just listing, as the guys have said, like inventory management or merchant system is not enough. You have to pick three of your best mechanics in there and l describe them a little bit in there. You know, put something in there that makes it unique to itself. Yeah, I think I think if you if you want to have the notion of a gun, I think a like a, a uh, modified potato gun that shoots golf balls or something like that. So it keeps on theme. Um, and you still get the notion of shooting. You can still have those mechanics. Um, I mean, this seems fairly interesting as a mix concept, especially if you play like the recent Mario Golf game with the running stuff. Um, like adding zombies to that as a part of the, the obstacle to like sink your sink your uh, uh, hole uh, could be pretty fun. Um, but yeah, I, <clears throat> it seems like something interesting. I'd like to play the demo. Someone got special treatment. Yeah, after you mentioned that you have an AK and you can like switch between them as you play, it's like, no, it sounds more interesting. You should show us the demo instead of the, the <laughs> paper. The uh, um, the title Fairway Evil the the especially I mean I'm seeing on my other screens bigger, but the character with the golf club gets lost in my opinion behind the text and. I know this is a little nitpicky, probably not super impactful, but if you're giving this sheet out to folks, it the title gets lost, I think, in the mix of everything here. It's darker, it's harder to see, it has the same faded, diffuse red border like everything else does. I would just work on that. But I don't know how to fix it. I'm no and and so, I'm willing to bet you'll get into trouble with people reading that as E V as opposed yeah, to Evo. Yeah, I was gonna say I, that. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't try to be too clever with your logo in that yeah. case. Uh, mm -hmm. two things mm -hmm. here that to be cool. a bit more concrete though. Um so this is just a pitch. You don't necessarily need to include a logo. It does help to sell a bit of a theme, but if you include something like this, try to make sure it's uh, passable by anyone you can before you actually show it to someone. Now, in this case, the problem with the text is mainly that it has uh, a darkening at the bottom and your background is black. Effectively, the text gets vignetted. That's a word that we can say. Um, and that makes it way harder to read because it's not the focus of what you have. The focus is the castle and the moon and neither the golf player nor the uh text are what people will look at so yeah something there to the point about like trying to define a, a logo if this is your initial pitch remember that's that's how they're going to remember that visual so um you probably want to avoid it or not something that's like super memorable in this regard because if you change it later or you don't like it or something like that then they 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 still are thinking about the old logo or something like that uh, in this case if you you probably would make some serious changes or significant changes based on the feedback like the coloring and stuff and then it would look completely different um but i do agree about the ev thing the golf club doesn't come off as a l but i think my brain just completes the word just because evil seems like the appropriate word to put there um, but i could definitely see people not seeing the background character and just wondering yeah. what fair, fairway ev is I mean, the even the background character with the background character with the club that actually makes an L. If you shrunk that character down and put it at the end there, yeah, you'd still yeah. see the character outline, but it would be an L, yeah, um, and would read better than the. The problem is also you're getting you're getting the V lost in the fact that it's got the same coloring as the character. So yeah, put the character smaller and bring it to the end. But that's yeah, minor. Um, and this um, is just one other thing broadly about just generally game writing this kind of stuff. Um, the, the, there's two main parts to think about when you're trying to decide, when you're trying to explain something like this. Uh, there is your theme and your tone. They're both vastly different things. They're often confused together. Um, theme might be uh, where or, or what the setting is, and tone is how you say it. For example, the theme of Batman is Gothic City, big, you know, metropolitan area, but the tone could be everything from 
Goofy Batman to Dark Knight, right? They're, even though the theme is the same, the tone is different. And something like this, thematically, it's very clearly horror genre and golfing and whatever, but I have no idea what the tone is. Now, it's implying it's kind of dark and, you know, resident evilly, but then there's, like, talks about Sackler Estates and the comedy of stuff and evil. Like, I, I don't know. Is this going to be a fun game? Is this going to be irreverent? Is it going to be dark and scary? So it's worth figuring that out and making sure that your pitch tells not only what theme you're going for, but the tone of the experience as well. Hmm. That I, makes sense. I do have a me, question of... Go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, it, it, it seems like farcical, the idea of golf course and zombies. So it seems to me like it's going to be sort of tongue in cheek and, 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 you know, you're on a golf course and you have to kill zombies with golf balls and golf clubs. That's see, but that's so, the thing. I agree with you. Linguistically, but, you it does. Yeah. but look at the screen. Yeah. And if it didn't say that, if there was, if you, if there was nothing about like looking at it now, it looks dark. Everything's blood red. <laughs> There's horror, horror, everything's scary, red glowing things. And you're like, it's a wacky romp for you. Is it like, I don't, I see no yeah. like irreverence in the, in the description of what I'm saying, you know? Um, yeah. It does seem odd uh, to your point that it's a survival horror game, you know, zombies. And I assume that there's some level of tension but his target audience is casual golfers. A casual golfer to me is not some is someone who like just wants to play a golf game and, and golf normal um, casually. Um, so what what about this mix appeals to a casual golfer as a specific uh, target audience? Because um, uh, it definitely I'm not as a casual golfer. I'm not I'm going in this to golf. I'm not going in this to kill zombies um, while golfing. Um, so I'm not sure that 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 particular audience is who it's uh, going to read well with um it's my first so question. can i just play survival so, horror casual golf <laughs> <laughs> so here's something i want to bring up actually because it's related um this chart this presentation paper has no um outlining of which order you should read things in yeah and this is something that could trip up uh any reader of your content uh, if you're trying to explain something and they're reading it in a different order from you, you might run into a bit of trouble. So adding a flow in any shape or form, like connecting lines or arrows or uh, making it vertical and uh, more readable in that way might do you some justice. Uh yeah, well, that's, that's layouting in general, right? Like again, yeah. so so this is this is kind of slightly off topic, but it is worth knowing if you're doing some kind of pitching. Um, I said it before, the golden rule is the squint rule. Look at the whole screen and just squint your eyes; so you can barely see it. And then ask yourself, what order do things pop out to you in, and read in that conceptual order. Um, like now, for me, it would be logo, game summary, game outline, and then it would go up and then right and then down again, which oh, is kind of an odd reading order. Um, mm. But that's down to sizes of headers relative to size oh, yeah, of the boxes yeah. and so yeah. on. Um, in general, though, what you want to do is make sure that there's a hierarchical order. Like you want to drive how someone experiences your story. Um, and in general, like there's a separate note from that. Personally, I think the summary should be a log line. The very first thing I should read before any of this should be um, play golf with, you know, weapons and zombies, yeah. you know, can you survive? Something that just very succinctly goes, here's what I'm doing. W does that sound fun to you? Now read the details. Because yeah. you're pitching a story here when I don't even know what the game is yet, you know? If you had to describe mm. your game in one or two sentences, that should be like the first thing that you start with. Mm. Um, Tagline. Uh, is, so it's interesting that you say that because I was thinking about the read order too because I'm going, I'm just going top down top down and then i realized that without because the gameplay mechanics section i'm not sure what the what the title would be for that because it's three various things in there um but when you say that yeah now i just like flow to game outline and then weirdly enough i go to community engagement then i go to the features of the 18 hole so it definitely feels uh kind of weird um without some sort of guidance on how to read it um but, I mean, how would you solve, in this particular case, how would you solve that, Jason? Like, what would you do to change the flow? Uh, it's white. It's so, literally, uh, the, the problem is you have to look at it from, there's a reason why headers have header orders, right? H1, H2, H3. Yeah. 
Yeah. Right now, both headers have the same weight, and so your brain's going to go, which one gets my attention more? It'll be the bigger box. And because of that, they're all equal weighted. Traditionally, what you want to do is have, a, for starters, I would have the logo be like a fraction of the size, like a quarter of it. It does not need that much real estate on screen. Uh, next, I would have, the, I, would, I would do it in strips. The top strip would just be logline, and then there'd be a large box on the left that would be the summary portion, and then I would just have everything else on the side and the right. And so you'd, you'd have a category of top, left, right. Your brain would read it in a clean order, um, and it would read in order of importance, which is what the summary is, what the part I'm trying to sell you on is, and the details if you care enough to get this far. Yeah, sorry about that. My mic is uh, kind of deciding to flop. <laughs> Um, also, just as a side note, too, but, things like featuring eighteen holes in strange locations, the, the 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 strange and eccentric locations bits cool, but you're giving a list of locations and and levels when I don't like I have no context yet, and the list yeah. of levels doesn't mean anything to me. So yeah. that seems like a lot of wasted real estate when you could, if you just said, play across wacky environments like everything from secret labs to you know uh, reflecting ponds or whatever, then you you've got you've sold that point in a, in a tagline rather than having to eat a fraction of your, your pitch which yeah it's, it's not like writing the word airfield is going to add a lot more like i, w I would probably pick the most interesting zoo airfield yeah. and power plant and i would just say across a wide range of areas such as da -da 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 -da, you know it could be yeah. a point in your game outline basically uh, I do want to point out that the bigger box isn't the only thing here. There's also color, and one thing that caught me off guard at the start is the top boxes are actually black, while the uh, lower one are blue. And the biggest box, the blue, is a blue one, and it connects you to other things on its own level, other blue boxes. So you end up not reading the top two, and one of them is really, really important because it describes your genres and other games for reference. <laughs> Yeah, so, it, it's uh, hard to tell on the small screen, but on the big screen, yeah, it's it's like a it's blue because there's a faded background. In fact, on the bottom right of the game summary, there's a character. I can't tell what it is, but underneath necessary and par, there's some character, and then there's a whole uh, golf um, flag to the right of game outline. It's hard to see, but it's, it's faded out, so that blue effect is is yeah. That's... Yeah, the, the general general trick to that is two things. One, if you ever do anything like this where you have an artistic background with text in front of it, bring it into Photoshop and desaturate it. Remove the colors all the way back, and what you'll end up with is you'll see exclusively the contrast ratios. Or you can, there's contrast checkers online, but effectively all you're doing is you're removing the, um, the, the, the color value, and you're just leaving it to be contrasting against the different uh, lightness values. And you'll notice some of these things stand out better than others. And your goal is to hit, uh, it's called WCAG, Web Contrast Accessibility Guidelines, and it will tell you when something is not readable enough against the background it's on. That's one, and if you want a more express answer of how to solve these problems, honestly, add a blur. Add a gradient blur to your background just before you use it as a background, and you'll still have that cool, interesting set of shapes and colors, but it'll be, uh, there won't be harsh pixel lines that contrast against your colors. So it's just one thing in general. So I can see the opacity has been dropped, and it might even be blurred, but I would blur it further. And I would have painted out a character like that because it, it does. I, I didn't see it at first, but now that I see it, it stands out quite quite sharply as um, a character. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is this is good. And thanks for submitting this one. Um, if people want to see more of it, he actually has a site, fairwayevil.com, and there's YouTube videos on it and all the rest. So, you know, show him some love because he came on yeah. here, was brave enough to put this up. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Is, I mean, is he in here? Is uh, yeah, I saw him in the chat earlier. I don't know if he's still here now. I... Hopefully. <laughs> Overall, this seems like uh, an interesting premise. Like, yeah, I'd love go to... watch the videos yeah. after the show. It's it's good. Yeah, like like I said, the the idea is good. Like, this is not about the quality of the game or yeah, the idea. Yeah. It's exclusively about the pitch, and it's and the fact that, like I said, I've played portions of this, and the the game I've played is not a representative in that pitch. Is what I'm, is kind of the takeaway, right? Is ask yourself what your why is your game in existence? Like, what do you think is missing that this game provides? And put that in your pitch. And I think there's a lot more. Describe the loop or the experience someone will be playing, and it'll it'll resonate more. I think. 
All right. Before we go on to the next pitch, I wanted to open it up so people could enter to win the copy of Rider. So I've got the app running right now. We're listening to chat, and I've put up the choices for characters. If you put in a character choice, your character should appear, and then you'll be queued up, and then near the end of the show, we'll go through and actually run through and pick out the winner. So you'll all battle and get in line. Me and uh, Jason got in first because he was helping me test it out. So anybody wants to join, feel free to just uh, put in the character that you want to be, and you'll pop right in, and then we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. I'm going to let that keep going. Oh man, that's that's huge. Doesn't fit either. Um, I'll probably just close that out in a second. I'll leave it up there for just a second. What did you guys ready to hop over to the next pitch, or you guys have any questions about uh, our giant uh, character selection? There, let's see. Let's get ourselves up there. And if any of the Jasons win, you know it's rigged. Well, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> wouldn't that be great? Uh, I feel bad for the person that Jason's story takes out. And they're like, no, actually, it's going to be me versus him first. It's going to be the first battle. Right? Ooh, it's, the way it's set up is it takes the people. So if you see the person on the opposite side of you, that's who you're fighting. That's 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 your next battle. <laughs> be able to tell who, who you're up against. So if you want to join, yeah, you can just type in the character you want to be, and you'll join the chat or join the battle. We've got 32 right now. Hopefully, we'll get a, a couple hundred by the end of the stream. All right, I'm going to hide that one for now. You guys ready for the next um, the next one to share? So there is something I wanted to bring up prior to that because the golf bit uh, kind of uh, is a close point to my heart, not for reasons I expected. Um, in Terraria, we actually have golfing that we added in the update um, 1.4. And to add golf to Terraria, we ended up spending about one year of development because the character had to hold the golf sticks um with both hands and we Oops. had no system for this we had to redo all the torsos all the 200 armor sets just to support holding an item with two hands and as we did this we started utilizing the system for many other things and we also um ended up in a situation where while we were making golf, we tried to shoot it at different things, and we ended up starting to use zombies as part of the development process of checking mm -hmm. that the golf club bounces properly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and um, we ended up being very, very uh, involved in a heated debate on whether do we make a golf weapon class. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, to put a bit more context, in Terraria 1.3, we actually added yo-yos. And for means beyond my comprehension, we ended up with um, at least 20 yo-yos and multiple yo-yo accessories that are all melee weapons, and they're some of the strongest weapons in the game. <laughs> so you can literally throw yo-yos to, to destroy spaceships and <laughs> whatever have you. <laughs> as, as an ex-yo-yo master, I still have to get one of those off you, one of the official uh, Terraria yeah. yo-yos. Uh, yeah, we also have uh, official uh, metal yo-yo um, merch, so <laughs> multiple ones. Oh, do you? Yeah, for, uh, from one drop. So uh, real genuine expert yo-yos. <laughs> Use them to take out a spaceship. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's some theme of their bosses, et cetera, et cetera. It's it, it just, it's, it's really funny and close to my heart how much involvement golf can give to your game unexpectedly. <laughs> All right. Should we hit this next pitch? Yeah. So let's uh, see if I can make this nice and big. And then um, I'll remove the choices the choices are still there you can still pick um you, you'll see it all in a few minutes when we jump back over to it so let's take a look at this pitch it's for machine angel which also kind of struggles from that font thing i thought it said mock angel at first um but uh, should i read through the gameplay part or maybe i'll just read through the whole thing and then we can talk about it read the tag, yeah. yeah read Isn't it out loud to everybody or unless Salim wants to read it maybe with I like try. Uh, all right go for it <laughs> <laughs> but it's got to be. It got to have some feeling here. So. Mm -hmm. I don't know I mean, how to. Do like a movie. <laughs> I'm a robot. Um, I want you to be Salim L. Grant. <laughs> uh, Machine Angel. Machine Angel is a dystopian boomer shooter where you incinerate hordes of synthetic evil. 
leverage the power of time control, neurochemical corporate weaponry, and augmentation to ascend to digital heaven. Woo! <clears throat> Gameplay. I'm going to go back to normal voice now. Uh, the machine that wasn't your awakens. normal voice? <laughs> <laughs> I, can do, I can do like high-pitched Mickey voice. Um, uh, the machine angel awakens in a gladiatorial hellscape of chaos and violence on savage... Oh, man, sorry. On savage impulse... Okay, hang on, hang on. Let me read this directly from here. She begins to cut on the screen. The yellow bars make it easier to read. <laughs> make sure you practice your pitching before you make it uh, in an yeah. office to hang anyone on. else. <laughs> All right, here we go. The machine angel awakens in a gladiatorial hellscape of chaos and violence. On savage impulse, she begins to cut down mechanized abominations to enhance her arsenal of deadly weaponry and reality-bending abilities. As a machine angel kills, she learns, and as hordes of enemies are destroyed, they begin to summon ever darker beasts to hasten her destruction. Guide the machine angel on her path through the varied and gruesome levels of a bleak digital hell world and turn all that stand before you into wet gore. Rewind time to attack simultaneously from multiple angles, slaughter chaos to replenish your kit, and make split-second decisions to survive your ascent through this engineered nightmare. Lore summary. <clears throat> In 3307, Zhao Xing Heavy Industries, forgive me if I'm pronouncing that really horribly, uh, introduced digital heaven to a society brainwashed by hyperconsumption. Yeah, sorry. Uh, no longer would people want or feel fear, knowing that they would live live on forever in Eternet, the, the new hereafter. I'm butchering this. Uh, but would paradise okay. be all that it could be uh, if it were full of people so filthy? It was this very question that led the board to create the nightmare, a digitized display of dopamine-laden ultraviolence live streamed to every screen on the planet. The participants, the tainted souls of the ruined underclass, unwilling, unwillingly indoctrinated on the false promises of eternal paradise, all had finally grown predictable, but for an improbability that, in any other time, would be called a miracle, the arrival of the machine angel. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, I... Do you guys need me to read the our team part or eh, it's great. Uh, uh strangest strangest.io is a collective of creative minds spread across North America. Together we have released a handful of strange and wonderful games, including the Nightmare I prototype in 2020. The spiritual successor of Machine Angel is our current work in progress and a major milestone on the roadmap for the team. Yeah, so <laughs> I have a point I want to bring up before anything else here drop the yellow lines in this document because they oh. completely destroy any reader's ability to properly read a full sentence and if you listen to salim reading it for the first time now and i'm, I'm not bashing you i'm just saying oh, no. uh, your readers are going to get stuck like this every single time it breaks their flow and it breaks their interest because of that they're going to have to put effort to just understand what you're trying to give them the desaturation so, trick would do wonders here and probably yeah, but, the font selection is also yes to blame. The yeah. font so it completely screws it up. You can hardly see the periods and commas. Um, there definitely needs to be a couple of uh, paragraph breaks. Um, like guide the machine angel on her path through. That should have been a paragraph break there. Um, and the font is definitely was tripping me up like crazy. And hi make sure you can highlight what's important in your pitch because right now there's absolutely nothing of higher importance than other things. Um, uh, ju just so that it's not theoretical, because I know I've mentioned it twice now, um, here's a link to me putting that through a contrast checker, and you'll see what it says effectively. Um, gives you an idea. So you'll see what you've done. is You, you basically take what's the, the primary foregrounds and backgrounds, and you can go through each of the colors, and I just sort of picked two of them as an example. Um, and you can check each color against it as a foreground or as a background, and it'll give you a rating at the bottom. And that rating will tell you whether it's uh, contrasting well. Um, oh. Right at the bottom of this image, it might be hard to see because of our, there you go. Uh, you've got your, what's your rating? Do you get an, a, a double or triple uh, A, whether it's um, the font size is high enough, whether the contrast ratio is high enough, whether the difference of the actual uh, color, uh, the, the hue is, is strong enough apart. Um, yeah, there's a lot to this, but effectively you want to make sure you get greens across the board. Um, in, in the cases where it's just the dark text against the white background, it's fine. But as we've said, 
if you pick other colors, then the contrast isn't high enough. So you, you in general want to avoid having um, too much of that. Uh, they call it vibrating, where, where your eyes are actually kind of flickering, trying to catch the uh, the contrast between the colors. Yeah, uh, just literally, if, if you type contrast way. checker into Google, there's like there's four of them. Any of the top four do exactly the same thing. There's no there's no specific um, one that matters. Yeah, and also if you really don't want to go through the full process of going through a contrast checker, there is a really easy trick in Windows 10 that you can just enable black and white um, colorblind mode uh, with a hotkey. That's uh, you go through the options first, but then it's literally Control Windows C and you can turn any document into black and white. And that lets you see strong contrast in uh, luminescence or brightness. Huh. And uh, yeah. that can let you see if there are any patches of text that would be harder to see. Because if you do that, specifically right now, you'll see um, that the portions where there are the uh, diagonal uh, black lines on the yellow are basically marks that make all your text way harder to see than the others. Um, I did put a link for it um, in black and white, but I probably should put it on YouTube. Well, what about the content here? So uh, yeah. I think yeah. we talked a lot about the formatting, and I think every, hopefully yeah, so everybody's I, starting to get the idea to make it so that your stuff isn't difficult to read. So um, I think read it, but. ultimately for the gameplay description, it's being written as if you're assuming people understand uh, how significant a lot of the stuff is. Like, um, you know, you go through all that like hyper descriptive gameplay stuff, and then at the end, you say something like rewind time to attack simultaneously from multiple angles. That particular line is somewhat interesting to me, uh, but it's just kind of buried in you know, slaughter chaos to replenish your kit. I don't know what that means. Um, uh, like it, it sounds like that last that last sentence there sounds like it's actually like describing gameplay and 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 like it could be elaborated on a little bit, whereas the rest of it is just kind of. I don't know. It's it's being written from an uh, from a level that where I'm supposed to like understand exactly. Yeah, it's 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 yeah. flavor text. So so the thing is, a lot of people don't realize is there's names for each of these categories. We talked about the um, the log line or the elevator pitch or whatever. What you've written there as your first paragraph is what's called a blurb. It's literally the name B L U R B, and it refers to a chunk of promotional descriptive text that sells you on an experience not mechanically. And so that's the exact kind of thing you'd put on the back of a box, which is probably what you're picturing when you wrote it. But that is not what you pitch with, because that doesn't tell anybody. Usually when you read that, you've already picked up the box, you've been sold by the front artwork, you turn it around, there's images of the style of gameplay, there's a list of whether it's an RTS or whether it's a shooter or whatever, and then you read the blurb to see if it's tonally something that you enjoy. But, but before we can get to that, we don't really have a lot. Now, he does say uh, boomer shooter, but it, so that's... yeah. But I don't know, is this going to be third person, first person? Is it going to be, I presume it's a first person shooter, but it's kind of hard to tell. It is a first person shooter. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it would be mechanically, again, like I, I know I've kind of harped on this a bit. For me, what matters is the game loop. What, like, can I get a sense? Can, can I estimate and write down a, a, a one minute loop of I do this, I shoot this stuff, I collect ammo, I do this, I go here? Um, and I can I can get some estimates of that from this, but again, um, as 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 we're as well as Salim specifically said, there's it's kind of hidden in there that that this this is a great pitch once someone's already on board and they already know what the mechanics of it are. So I think you need a higher level descriptive. What do you do, and then come back to this stuff. Yeah, yeah and in addition to that, just a small thing: if you're going to put a QR code that's clickable and all the rest, it goes to a link. Put a link in as well. Um, it's not completely obvious on the PDF that this is a clickable uh, QR code, which it is, which is fine. But yeah, stick a link in as well, because then I can go to your game and get even more information in yeah. there, uh, which I'll only do if I like the blurb and everything that people have been talking about is relevant in that. Uh, but once I go in there, I can see, yeah, you're using basically a Doom engine with very heavy neon uh, graphics, Ooh. which is fine. Uh, people are into that. Um, and I can see the game. Um, uh, on your H I do. I do want to say that a more concrete. Um, if nobody is going to click that uh, QR code because they don't see it's clickable and they don't get to this page, you might want to include a game mechanics uh, or genres section like the previous pitch. Like just I, I even mean just them. that image. Literally, that image of yeah. a gun 
with, with fire and like like that tells me so much more than ten yeah. paragraphs of text. This isn't the see, game though. This is the precursor one, right? This yeah, is the nightmare, nightmare the one that they mentioned. This yeah. is the, the, the other one or whatever. The, right? Oh, okay. Nightmare this is one. what you get when you click the QR code. So yeah. I saw. I just realized. I think this is the one that right. they mentioned was the one they'd made before, and then this new one is the the follow up. Okay, you want to mention that then in your doc when you're doing that, because uh, it says check out the prototype. Right, right. Yeah. I may I may sound weird here, but um, uh, I don't think I've heard the term boomer shooter like ever before. Uh, is that is it a culture does war? That mean thing? that it's it's just an old school shooter that boomers play, or what is that? What is that supposed to mean? Ultimately, can any of you guys describe tell me what that means? Or, or well, I thought, it, it, I thought it was it's a doom shooter. Boomers. Yeah, I gotta yeah. say, I've I've heard it in the context of specifically aiming for that uh, doom esque low resolution mm. but high nostalgia fast paced shooting stuff in that context. But could you yeah. just call that like a classic shooter or something? Because boomer, like, so if the intent the is problem- that it's supposed to be targeting boomers, it sounds like it could actually be someone insulting to certain people. Um, as a tagline, but, yeah. so I, I it's a it's more of a cultural thing th- uh, these days. But yeah. it it's basically meant to be a retro shooter in yeah. a sense. Mm. That yeah, you, the more respectable way to say it. Yeah, as, as a general rule, if you've got strafing and rocket jumps, it's probably a boomer shooter, right? Like gotcha, that's generally gotcha. the, <laughs> the general thematics. Gotcha. Sorry if and I if sound you like, like it. You probably send text questions. messages, oh, yeah. right? <laughs> What's that? I said, if you like it, you probably send text messages. <laughs> They're giving me shit. <laughs> so it, it should be called like the text message sending shooter. So here's a pretty rough question uh, by thinking about this as a whole. If it is a boomer shooter, what does it do that Ultra Kill doesn't? Because if it's competing against Ultra Kill, which is one of the highest uh, rated games on Steam right now, by the way, um, in percent at least, and relatively good actual quantity of reviews. What do we get out of this that we don't get there? The only thing that I'm seeing that might twist it up and make it its own unique experience is the time manipulation. But I have difficulty figuring out how would you even do this in a way that doesn't um, completely destroy itself from a gameplay mechanic. Have you tried this out? Do you have any experiment that would uh, show this actually works. <laughs> now, I, I know we're only looking at a single page here, but you might want to include more sections about this if it's highly experimental like that. Um, I do have a comment on the lore too. Um, also in the lore, like there are certain things like that you're kind of assuming that people get what they mean, like light streaming and stuff like that. Um, I. I I mean, I guess I can make a guess at what live streaming means, um, uh, but like just getting caught up on some words, like I, like I said, I, I don't, I didn't know how to say. I guess it's Zhao Xing, um, but seeing like Ethernet is also kind of weird to me. Um, this is, I guess, is more personal, but I just read it as Ethernet, and then that forms into my brain. Is that actually what you mean there? Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, from the story standpoint. Um, there are some things there that my brain just kind of went to, does this mean this? Um, I wish it was explained or if it was worded differently um, without trying to use kind of a keyword. Um, that I mean, later on in the game, obviously you'd explain that, um, uh, but it just felt uh, like a couple things there could be worded a little differently. And of course, page breaks, the paragraph breaks would be nice. Mm. I, I, I think oh. that if, if you were to kind of take a higher level as to the general, the arguments we're kind of highlighting around here, is one of the biggest mistakes people make with pitches of any kind is not knowing your audience. And there's different people you're talking to. For example, as highlighted here, it's one thing. So if you're using a term like boomer shooter, which again, it's perfectly valid. I, I have no problem with that personally because I've heard of it. I've heard it before in this context. I know what it means. Mm-hmm. But the problem is you're using that with an implication that you're. So the, the context of using that word means I am talking to people who already know this, who are a fan of this genre. That's who I'm talking to. For those people, the gameplay portion, like I said, is a blurb. They're already on board. They're probably likely to buy it. So the audience implied in the way this is written is people who already play those kinds of games. They're already likely to be on board, and you're selling them on a story. 
but you, they, you don't need to tell them on gameplay because you presume they're going to like the gameplay. But is that really who this is for? If this is a pitch document, you're pitching to someone who's either going to be giving you money, in other words, they want to know what the hell the thing is, or you're pitching it to somebody who doesn't play these kinds of games and you have to sell them on it. So the question becomes, who is this document for? And right now, it seems to be like something that you would give to somebody who already plays these kinds of games, and in which case... It's that's fine. Like it would do that job well as like a hype document to get people on board. But again, I don't know what differentiates this in the market. I wouldn't know uh, much about the development of it or what to expect or or you know what I mean. Like if if it was me as someone who's either trying to choose if I want to play this, who's not a regular player of these games, or choose if I want to help fund it or produce it, I don't know what this is. There's not enough here for me to get the information I actually want out of the pitch. So figure out who the pitch is for and and give them the information they're probably going to ask for. So I do want to bring up something in this pitch's favor that it got the interest of Salim and asking questions uh, repeatedly throughout. So you have that going for you, even if he doesn't know what he's uh, going into. <laughs> uh, I am I am concerned that there is not much uh, included compared to the other games in the genre, which should have helped you uh, show where you're trying to place yourself at. But I think it does a good enough job with the blurb. Honestly, just a line of game mechanics would have uh, made this into a viable pitch entirely, in my opinion. Yeah, like, like for me personally, right? Time mechanics is, is one of those buzz phrases. I love everything with time in it. I play almost every game I possibly can that has some level of time control. And I missed it. I'm not saying I didn't know it. Like, it, it, it flew by in a blurb of stuff. It's yeah. like, oh, that's kind of a cool stuff. But if that's if that's like a differentiating factor where you tell me you get to play a frenetic shooter with rocket jumps and dashes, but you can control time, it's like, well, okay, now you have my attention. Like, yeah. why is that not first thing that grabs my attention of what, I'm, what this is? It's all the stuff you're used to, but imagine time too, you know? Yeah, and for, I mean, you know, from that point of view, also if you're used to in this one crazy thing, like basically that entire paragraph should have just been laden with how that time manipulation is somehow being used as you're describing, you know, ascending the thing instead of it just being that one sentence. And I know that last week we talked about like having, like having that surprise thing in your pitch to make people ask you a question to move further on. And this is kind of an example of that, like being perfect, um, because when I read it, you know, before I read it out loud, that one line stood out for sure out of anything else. Um, but I think in this case, uh, it definitely just gets buried. Um, and while it's a good thing, it isn't necessarily super strong enough. Um, but I see where rewind, I think about games like fatal rewind and stuff like that. Uh, but generally reading about the machine angel, I just kept thinking about still harbinger from like PS one day. So. I thought it was a completely different game. I didn't think it was a first person shooter or anything like that. Um, so I had been lost completely on what the game would have even been. Um, but I would have been piqued by the rewind time part um, uh, enough to, you know, at least like inquire further. And, and again, like I really harp on this. I want to know what my experience is going to be. And if I, if it was me selling that game, I would say, I would talk about this whole, again, the frenetics of, of a boomer shooter and all the speed and the fast, whatever. And those games often have overkill mechanics or these like, oh, explosive deaths or all this kind of stuff. I would say some blurb about, because you have this like live screen mechanic, it reminds me of The Running Man or something to that effect. And then I would have, I would mention something like, uh, kill an enemy, rewind time, kill him again to double your points. Something like that that tells me, ooh, that's a cool thing. I get to basically run around an arena killing things and I use time to like, multiply my score or do something fun or appease the crowd by doing more gory kill whatever whatever it is you're doing yeah but give me a mechanic that tells me okay there's time rewinding i get to control it it's for this kind of concept or mechanic of like doubling scores or for increasing multipliers or something and then suddenly i get a sense of what the experience is why i'd play it and you don't need to write a blurb about like the, the city and the people and so it's, it's good to have that but yep. if you tell it through the mechanics of i'm getting double kills to increase my multiplier to get new weapons or something i already can tell the philosophy of the world that we've, we're now live streamed and there's you know people watching it and, and and trying to appease them so yeah it's it's more it's just selling selling the, the the minute to minute to me is always the most important thing i want to know literally what would i be doing <laughs> if there's no gifts or videos i need to know narratively what what are my beats as i play like for example, you could a... you could describe you could describe an experience like of you doing something and like destroying something in some cool ass like boomer shooter way, and then you just finish that with what if you could do it again, 
rewind, blah, 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 blah. Like you could, you could like right there, as soon as you read, read the experience, you know what the game is in kind of a short stint. And then you just say, what if you could do it again? And people, oh, wait, what do you mean? And then you just bleed into rewind time. And then you just let it, you just let it sit there and then describe other stuff like that, that in itself, you've, you've basically like checked all the boxes. I kind of get an idea of what the gameplay experience at the base, but wait, I can manipulate this core like experience that I've experienced before by messing with time. Oh, tell me more about that. From a business standpoint as well, I want to know what platform you're going to be releasing on. Uh, so I want to know what platform you're going to be releasing oh, on, yeah. depending on what the yeah. pitch is intended for. If it's for an audience, you don't have to do this, but like release date um, as well. I want to have, even if it's TBD, you know, I, I want to know I'm coming out on PC. We're going to target the consoles or I'm a mobile application. We're going to be releasing on this. And most pictures include a couple of screenshots, even if they're depending on where you're at in your project, uh, but they should be on there as well. <clears throat> but yeah, target platform. <coughs> Next point. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, just, just one last one on that. I 100% agree with you, and I this is one I struggle with saying as advice because I know it's a hard thing for people to do. Um, it may seem weird or wrong to do this, but if you don't have images of gameplay, you're better off posing a scene and taking a shot of it as if yeah. it's an in-play gameplay mm -hmm. just so people have a sense of what you're visioning. Yeah. And yeah. if you don't have that and you're afraid... Again, someone mentioned that it was um, assets that they don't own, so they're not, they didn't want to do that. That's fine. Pay a concept artist. Go to Fiverr, pay the money, do it once, and get an image that's a concept of your game. Um, you like your pitch will be ten times more likely to be picked up if there's at least one image of what even is this, right? There needs to be something mm -hmm. that implies gameplay, and that that speaks so much more volume because it tells you what your objectives are. What you highlight in your own images indicate where your intentions are. Are you focusing on? a boss battle type scene are you focusing on like if i had a concept image of a time bubble affecting a bunch of enemies that are blowing up with like all of this frenetic stuff that tells me okay that's what the game is that's the experience they've chosen the screenshot and tell me about the game so it may cost money to do that and it might be an issue for some people depending on how much you're putting into it but if you're using a pitch to get funding you have to invest in your own project and if you can afford to one concept image will do 10 times more for you yeah, and the if you're sending it in a PDF, it doesn't have to be a huge picture. You can have thumbnails down the bottom that give me a little indication that I can click on that really, that take me to larger images, uh, and then I'll open those. Uh, but on a busy day, uh, a lot of people reading pictures might skip your document. The same, mm -hmm. same way when we were talking about CVs and stuff like that, is to avoid having your document skipped. Um, so these are just an extra you can put in. All right, before we go on, um, I just wanted to remind everybody to enter the giveaway. If you want to win a copy of Rider, just pick your character in chat by saying any one of the ones that are down there listed, and you'll appear on the sidelines and be ready to battle when we start the giveaway, which will probably be, I think we'll kick it off after this next um, project or submission review. That's before nice we do, though, um, I just wanted to check with Andrew. I know you don't have much more time. Was there anything else that uh, you wanted to drop in with feedback or just things that are important that people should know about this week or for the holidays that are coming up? No, self-promotion. There's a big sale on the asset store if you're not tired of sales yet. And there's uh, Infinity PBR stuff. But uh, aside from that, I've, I've been head down. I've been doing, you know, it's the holidays, so I've been doing family stuff and some volunteering. So I haven't been doing as much work as uh, uh, on my own stuff. I have been trying to do a few hours every day. But um yeah, so it's just going through, and hopefully with some vacation time coming up, I'll get a lot of work done on my own stuff. I'm very excited about that. I'm sure many of you are also very excited about getting more time on your own stuff. For those of you who have day jobs, and might be getting a day or two off. But yeah, but I am going to be go hanging on. out. No, I've got I've got to drop off. I've got to go do a, a volunteer thing with some animal charity thing, local animal charity. They want to raise money for some dogs, and I support that. So. I like dogs. Weeks. Awesome, man. Very noble goal. And also the noble goal of trying to develop your thing daily. <laughs> yes. Yes. Ben, I, I, that's the thing. Like yesterday, I kept I kept not wanting to do any dev work, but I actually got like four or five hours in because I just kept like doing 30 minutes or an hour here and then doing something else and then coming back to it. I kept 
coming back to it. And that's important. So. Nice. Well, yeah, good job on the dog stuff, man. And yeah, congrats on the sales. Hopefully they keep going great. It seems like you've had a lot of good stuff on sale and hopefully everybody has been taking advantage of it. And for this project, hopefully I can get you into it soon to start swapping out the character models and then we'll have not just eight random little cute things, but a bunch of crazy cool ones with animations and all kinds of cool stuff. So I, I, I have the project open now. I finally got it open. Turns out I was I was trying to download the exact version of Unity required to, to make sure I was on the same version. And I pushed the wrong button. I downloaded the Mac version, which is a standalone <laughs> build, and it didn't it wouldn't let me install it. I you have to download the hub. I thought the hub button was to download the actual Unity hub, not to download it in the hub. It was very confusing. And so that, oh. that tripped me up. But I've got it open now. And so I was I was taking a peek at your code and and saying, ooh, what can I learn from Jason here? And then so, we'll have to set it up so people can go in and like customize their character on a web interface, adjust mm. their character shape and size, get them all in there and make their own like make them match their own face and then pop in. Make the whole game multiplayer. That's what I'm thinking, right? Like it's all I mean, multiplayer with a web interface to get in. Yeah, <laughs> web client. We'll it seems on, like the, the best way to do it. Publish it on the Sting. Switch so people can use their Switch in order to join the contest. Oh, that's ridiculous. You got to go to PS5. You need better graphics. <laughs> okay. Of course, of course. <laughs> um, one thing I do want to bring up, though, do uh, import Amplify Shader Editor, and I'll try and set you up with some really nice uh, special effects for these uh, fights. <laughs> Nice. That, that would be good. Yeah. Right now, the the fights are are not <laughs> not very pretty. I am excited. Jason uh, already committed a health bar that we're gonna pull in. Um, maybe pull that in later today or something. It's got some nice fancy effects, and I think that. But but just for context, I didn't like make a health bar for this. I just dug up an old script, dropped it in to test if I could make a commit. That's not like my. That's not <laughs> me doing a sales pitch on how it should look. That's me saying, "Here's a script. Let's see if I can commit." So that, there'll be more work to be done if I was going to actually engage with UI stuff. Oh, caveats everywhere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I think it looks Good great, up. and it's a lot better than my current health bar which was actually just that i again i used the gradient thing that uh your had recommended i think two three episodes ago it's your eye or jason one of you two recommended that ui gradient pack that i grabbed on the asset store made for beautiful fast health bars without me having to jump to photoshop which was really nice so i gotta say thanks for that <laughs> very good recommendation all right i'm gonna pop up the window one more time people can join looks like we've only got 62 out of the 118 people so if you don't want to win or copy a writer don't say anything in chat if you do then just uh pick the character that you want by putting in one of those and, and, and totally just won't that. recognize your text unless you've already liked the video that's just a fact <laughs> you have to of course have liked the video oh yeah, yeah. like it and share it for extra health that, that's what it needs to be <laughs> well, that, like and share right for a buff <laughs> yeah yeah but um no, just just say the character you want, and it'll pop up. You, your character. If you're not seeing your guy already there, you're probably just off screen. And when we start the battle, you'll see your guy start to to move in and get ready to fight. So does capitalization we... matter? Real quick, there's no, a couple people. No, it's not case okay. sensitive. Use okay. two lowercase invariant on all the comparisons. Nice. <laughs> all right, I'm those. signing off. See you all. Thanks. All right, see you later, Andrew. I mean... Everybody, go check out the Infinity PBR stuff that's on sale. There'll be a link in the description below. Have fun with those pups. Oh, interesting. I did not know Andrew was that into dogs. I'll have to talk more about that later. So are you guys ready to jump on to the final pitch? Yep. All right. This one was quite a bit bigger. It included um, a video and a couple documents. It's got a deck. So it's got a... Yep. Yeah, there's think, an implication of more experience on this one, definitely. Yeah, nine years of experience, these guys. Yeah. Should we start with the... Um, I don't know if we should start with the online pitch or just the deck. I, th I think maybe right, the why deck. Why don't we just do the, the presentation PDF? Yeah, let's, let's do that. I think that'll probably share the, the best. Um, I just got to get it open up on here. One second to open that thing up. So this one, it had... Um, this presentation, a budget analysis, um, a whole bunch of stuff. Let me get this in Chrome. There we go. 
And if I can find my restream window, I should be able to share it. All right. So everybody, if you're joining the giveaway, you can still join. Um, it's just running in the background. I'll pop it up when we're done with this one, and you'll be able to see your name and, and all that stuff up here. All right. Let's go through this doc now. So we got the fatherhood doc. This is how much are you willing to sacrifice for someone you love? And then it's got all of the different sections. And then there was a trailer. Um, did, I, I don't want to pull up the trailer on this yet. We'll just go down through and start looking at some of the other parts. So then there's some images of what the game looks like. You can kind of see. I'm going to get, get it kind of a good view. It looks like side side view. Two characters, one following another, which makes sense. The name Fatherhood. And then um, game. So what do you guys think about this this slide right here? So I know we said to not compare yourself to the other games, but I will say that this is a very good way to portray something after you've shown screenshots of that thing. <laughs> because this is saying we already have our look. This is what we are going for thematically instead of um, we are going to be this, but something else. It's just we have something else, but this is what we were aiming for. So you can tell how much they they are borrowing from it compared to being their own thing. I agree, and that's one of those things where again, I've I've already read through the pitch and, and seen the video and stuff, so I get that they're going for it. But it's just worth noting that if you ever do this, what you've done is you've put a brain worm in someone's head yeah. to say, okay, but what's different? The minute they've done that, so by saying The Last of Us, I'm like, okay, The Last of Us, and then I'm thinking back to those above screenshots where I see an adult male with a young girl is like, okay, you're just making the last of us. Now I know it's more than that, but the point is you've now told me you're basing it off another game and showed me a screenshot of something that's nearly identical in terms of even the clothes they're wearing and the backpacks they're doing. So now you have to, you have to um, hook me back on, okay, but what's different other than the camera angle. Right. And so that's, it's fine to do this, but you have to have something afterwards to really like say, but it has this as a thing. And isn't and isn't War War of Mine a side scrolling game? Yeah. So if you say the gameplay is War is mine, it makes me think it's a side scrolling game, but the images above mm -hmm. it it's not a side scrolling game, right? Well, looks like I mean there is a road. No. It is, yeah. It looks like it's it could side... be a side scroller. Yeah. 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 I guess the it's side scroller from a perspective. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It, it, inside is probably the best they said by look design, right? Like it's yeah, it is yeah. specifically that sort yeah, of yeah, depth yeah. thing. All right, then we go on. There's the trailer and then the market section. Yep. I'm not sure I understand what this slide is. Oh, I guess it's the it's header. Just, right? It's just saying what's... What's, what's coming on the next three yeah. slides. Well, to be fair, I, they did put a trailer at the start. And if they actually took the time and prepared a trailer that you can watch that has a flow to it, animations and all that, to help you, guide you through this, might be worth the watch prior to everything else. It, it, it is it is a good trailer, and I will say uh, there's also a video pitch, like an actual description yeah. pitch. Yep. Um, and my my first my first statement was going to be the video pitch starts with a hello, this is our project, whatever. I would have skipped that and gone straight to the trailer at the start of that pitch because there's no point talking about your themes of your game until they've seen it. So the very first thing in your very first part of your pitch, if you have a trailer, you've got, you've got the best kind of marketing you can have. Show that first, you know? Yeah, we might be tackling this all in like a really bad order because it's just it was just a zip of a bunch of good stuff. <laughs> then again, when you're sending it, if you didn't send instructions, just be prepared that this might happen. Yeah. Not that um, you're doing anything bad. This is high quality. Yeah. Just if you want to maximize your chances of success, try to give a guided experience. And this is just a small thing from a from a d design perspective. I really do like this, the use of um, multiple textures and you've got your gradients and you've got your um, blurs and using textures with like that, that sort of paint stroke look to it. it's all great. But when you've got your images like this on the side of it, differentiate them somehow. Give them a drop shadow, give them a cornered edge, something. Because all the rest of it looks really nice, but then you've got this really harsh edges on these rectangles, which just don't look as good. So same with like the logo in the corner. Stylistically, whenever you're doing something like this, if you're making it stylistic like this, then everything that doesn't match that stands out twice as much. 
So I personally, it would just be a drop shadow, just a simple bottom right corner drop shadow under these images, even, even if it's a fake one, even if it's literally in a partially opaque um, black rectangle that takes up the bottom right corner and just does a little thing, it would, it would pull it out from the background. And I do want to bring up something really important about the similarity section uh, in the previous page, is that if the person you talk to did not play this war of mine, they would not know what to anchor to if this was missing. So good on you for adding that. It still isn't the full context of what your game is actually like, but the images and the similarities and the differences help convey its own game uh, as a backup for someone who doesn't know what this game is. Like, you can only pitch this to someone who played this war of, uh, of mine if you didn't include anything like that. It definitely helps, because I haven't played it. So I think that's helpful, seeing those differences and, and similarities. And then I'm not sure what this is. This is just inspiration? Oh, competitive, competitive analysis. analysis. Oh, wait. Yeah, I yeah. actually, this part got me, too, because I wasn't sure, because they're introducing Undying in the list. But I guess that's part of competitive analysis, is that those are those are the group that, they're com uh, that are considered competition. And then here they're showing how other games that they want to compete with have done and, and what the actual yeah, financials yeah. are, which is cool. It's good. Most people don't pay enough attention to it uh, and pay attention to whether or not their game can be successful for the project and scope that they're trying to build. Again, this isn't this guy's first rodeo. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell. And and the other thing, too, is that it's for people who are following along... Um, What's really interesting, and I know this, this is going to sound really silly to say, but if you look at a slide like this, competitive analysis, you might be thinking, oh God, all of this stuff I have to do and learn all this. Here's the thing. Even just having a slide called competitive analysis tells anybody reading this that you've thought about it. Yeah. And that alone is, this could literally be nothing. It could just be, it doesn't matter what's on the slide at this yeah, stage. Yeah. It's, it's told us that this person who's making this project is aware they're in a competitive market and they're competing. And so sometimes a lot of this is just literally indicating that you're actually putting thought into the area. Same with the, the funding. Like I have, I have a complaint about that and the fact that it's a, an XLS file. But the point is, the fact that I know that there's a costing document in indicates to me they know what they're doing, right? And so just being aware of what information you can give someone is a valuable thing. I like this slide yeah, too because, yeah. like, you see the the 400 million survival game market. Like, like it definitely like for you're going after someone for some funds. Like, this is a slide that's certainly targeting them. Um, <clears throat> so I think this is a Nice thing to add in here. Um, I, and I one, just, one other thing, I, though. No, sorry, go ahead. I, I wanted to touch on the uh, Bitly link that was there that linked to the document they already uh, previewed. Uh, it does link directly to it. There is no... Uh, when you have a Bitly link, it's usually concerning that you might have to wait the five seconds, et cetera, et cetera, at like low quality. But this actually links directly. And they put um, a custom address that is specifically easy to remember. Uh, related to game's name, which is a good thing to do because now with just five letters, I can kind of remember the name and go look it up if I need it. If yeah, I don't have a father CA the or father yeah. competitive analysis, that and yeah. it's perfect. easy to access information about your pitch in a more uh, data oriented. No, sorry, easy accessible information about your game. Uh, is good to have, especially for people who are more data oriented and say, okay, now I want to go look at this. This actually matters to me because I'm bought into your fantasy. Let's see the actual numbers. They can go in and it's actually a properly offered document and it even has links to all its references. Great. Um, and on this particular slide here, just one thing to note, you might look at this and go, oh, that looks good. I'll, I'll add one of those to my own game. But I'll be very careful with this. One look at the one look at the the fact there's an asterisk which shows a link to a particular article that's referencing it. Again, it's 2017. I'd be careful with with articles that are that old when you're referencing it relative to now. That's one. But two, be very careful about this stuff that you're being specific to what you're talking about, because one of the worst things you can do if you're talking to a financier and showing them a pitch like this is come out with some absolute nonsense statement like there is X million of games sold on Steam every year that holds this stuff. It's like that's our target. No, it isn't. Your target audience isn't Steam. <laughs> it is not number of games sold on computers. If you come out with bullshit like this that you're just trying to pad with the possibilities around it, you're, you're going to lose any credibility. So at least have something like this, which is very specifically 
survival game is the target market of what we're doing. And here's where I got my information from. Because if you just put a slide that says, there's so much potential for money on Steam because of all of these games that come out, it's like everyone knows. It's just, you're, you're bullshitting someone whose money you're asking for, right? So they're not, they're not going to take that kindly. However, Did if you, you know have the a video slide game that says my target big. audience was number of games sold on computer, <laughs> this would get a laugh at. <laughs> yeah, and the other thing you you haven't done, which I've seen a lot of pitches, whether that be for whole entire companies or games or something like that, is said that you're going to take this percentage of that market because I've seen a lot of people go like the transport industry for freight is so and so and so and so. Even if we get ten percent of that, it's like what makes you think you're going to get ten percent of the freight industry if you haven't even sold me on that? But you haven't done this, which is good. That's a large, um, large yeah. It's a, it's a massive thing. <laughs> The links are good. Um, you don't absolutely need the asterisks in the in the bit there. The fact that you've got the link at the bottom there. Um, when we do our own slides for this sort of thing with companies, we, we put those in. Uh, but that's fine. Um, and you put your price point and everything. Yeah. Nice. Cool. So everybody liked that one, I guess. Should we just yeah, hit the development I section? I haven't read this full fully through yet, but one thing I do pick up when I do when you tell me how much you can sell for your target market and all your target size and all the rest of it is I nearly always turn around and go, okay, what's your cost? Uh, what are you going to be spending to get that? What am I going to make off of your company uh, in relation to how much I'm going to give your company? But I don't know if that's what they're asking for. I haven't looked through this pitch yet, but that's something to bear in mind, if you tell me you're going to make this much money, I'm going to ask you how much money you're going to spend making it. Good old okay. ROI, right? Get, get the yeah. ROI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's, and it's good to see this in a game pitch. There's enough um, game pitches that I've seen that don't tell me anything about your target or that you, you've thought about this and the competitive analysis and all the rest that you brought in. Enough people send me things like, my game's awesome, and it's like, right, okay, well, who are you competing with? Is it a, like you're going to tell me you're going to be a pick free game and you're going into the mobile market? <laughs> Great. There's a billion of those out there. What differentiates you? What's your marketing cost to establish yourself, getting consumers into your game? And then that cost related to how much you're going to make per user and all the rest. Have you done that work to tell me you actually know what you're talking about? Are you just telling me you're going to do a pick free game that's going to go out into mobile? Well, if we get ten yeah, percent of the market, then you know. Well, yeah, pick free ten percent of the market. <laughs> yeah, just give me give me a ring. I'll uh, I'll, I'll fund you. <laughs> but anyway, I, I, I just, just I, I do want to say that the fact that we're even talking about this means this is a really in a really good place because yeah, they've done the work. If, if, yeah, yeah, like like yeah, attention. Yeah. We, we've moved on from even the point of whether or not the game is good, and we're talking about the viability of it as a market, right? You've, you've already gotten us to the point we've skipped whether or not we're considering <laughs> it, right? If this was a real pitch, you'd, you'd, you've moved the um, the Overton window on the conversation, which is good enough, you know. So you guys want to talk about the next slide, the development one? Developed levels uh, did catch me off guard. So. I, I admit these this like triple headed weird slide again. We talked about yeah. attention, right? Yeah. I, do, I do every one of these I've seen has annoyed me. So if if you squint your eyes again, look at the attention. I'm going to read top left, then kind of read the middle, and then I'm going to try to guess which of the three things in the corner relate to what. If these are headers, show them as headers, right? This this like U shaped connections of things. They don't like wh where's the hierarchy of order? Like what are you? What order do you want me to read this in? And it doesn't make much sense. So yeah, I just I this particular kind of slide I'd skip. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, the little subheaders in there that you're going to do headers on later on, I would just remove those, and you could just have this is the development section. This is just a section by section part. But anyway, yeah. I also I also don't the the content of that. I'm not sure. Development makes several dialogue branches develop levels yeah, work to achieve the best atmosphere. Yeah, it's I'm not generic sure what tasks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Kind of like this is what you, you, you could drop this bit. Yeah. Yeah, and and, and just this entire it's, page it's entirely, episode. the entire page entirely could be dropped. And when you say develop levels, you tell me absolutely nothing on yeah. what's going to happen because, at the very minimum, your game is going to need something. And yeah, it's, it's, it's like levels. a generic task list that you want to give to your team, not to the yeah. pitch you're presenting. You can keep those slides, but they're chapter slides. They're just telling me this section of the document that I'm about to read is this chapter on development, and you can lose the gump in there in those parts and the same for the other ones you've got enough in there in in the context of the other of your of your work but yeah so Jason, Karen. so on the production schedule it's really good that you have timelines for everything that you might have assuming this starts at the moment that 
you get the yes right now, I guess. Um, there is not much that um, you're not giving us a lot of time from a vertical slice into an alpha, uh, which is slightly concerning. But I mean, you know your schedule for the game better than anyone mm. else. So this is something I might bring up in conversation. Like, if you make a vertical slice and there are things to edit, uh, how much do you think you're actually going to manage to cram into an alpha state where the game is actually playable beyond just being a vertical slice? If you actually had everything going OK on the vertical slice initial presentation, perfect. But do you have any uh, course correction? Uh, buffer um mm. and and also like, maybe this is just personal preference but if so what you're doing here is you're talking about project management that's a whole different category in business at this stage production schedule you're, you're implying you have a project manager managing this and that you're doing you're managing your time if you're doing that the the way you do that is using gantt charts right if you're going to try to explain your your milestones breakdowns you want to explain them as they actually appear in timelines and calendars. So just as a thing, personally, just listing, this looks like kind of dreams to me, right? It's, oh, it would be cool if it delivered here, it would be cool if it delivered here. If you're telling me this is an actual production schedule, I want to see it as a production schedule. You don't have to have a production schedule, but if you are going to put one in, it, the difference between having a list of statements like this versus a Gantt chart of actual sections of time is night and day. That would tell me that you're actually, you believe this, that you are actively saying you're going to do this. Well, this just says I've picked stages of development and quarters of years and <laughs> I put the two together you know yeah and I don't know what comes in the next slides but if I you got to think of these um, pitch decks as a living document if you show me this the first thing I'm going to say is did you achieve it did you achieve this particular part so it's good in these slides that if you say this is our schedule coming through if we're later on and though that time's passed I'd like to see you put there achieved achieved you know that you've made your goals it's a it's a it's a qualifier for me as a company that pitches if you are achieving those goals in particular, that's a good qualifier. You know, you set out production schedule, you achieve that production schedule, and you're moving on through the rest, and you're asking for funds for the rest of that particular schedule. Which is why a Gantt chart is so useful, because if it was a Gantt chart, you could have a burn down rate on your Gantt chart to show you how you're doing in relationship yep. to your objectives that you're setting out. Um, well, one of the questions in the comments, probably worth talking about, is people are asking, what's the difference between a prototype and a vertical slice? A prototype is literally, is this worth exploring? It could literally be a bunch of white boxes that you're jumping around and just testing that it works. It's this is this is worth my time to continue investing in as an idea. A vertical slice is if you walked in on someone who's in the middle of the game and they're playing a sequence, what is their experience like? It should look like the game will look in completion, but in a strip. It's the difference between a horizontal slice would be the whole thing looking crappy. A vertical slice would be a couple of minutes looking exactly like you hopefully think it should look as a finished model. Yeah. And the reason being, the, the prototype proves it's valuable to continue developing. A vertical slice tells you this is how an experience will go as a game loop. And if that experience is good, you know scaling it out to a full game is worth doing. So yeah, you prototype on a way to make in a vertical slice, ultimately, because you're prototyping each individual feature. Prototype is like a lower level. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I love this question. <laughs> To put it in another way, prototype people get them confused all the time. They just yeah. throw prototype when they mean vertical slice, and it really annoys so, a lot of me. <clears throat> and and here's something pretty important about prototyping: you don't prototype the known; you prototype the unknown. You experiment. Mm -hmm. There is no need to yeah. prototype an inventory system yeah. that's been done in a thousand games. You can boot up any single one of them, use it for ten minutes, and say, "Okay, an inventory management system is okay." <laughs> you don't need to make an entire prototype for an inventory system. So. If you are making prototypes, make sure to not to do that and instead try and check only the unknowns, forget about anything else. <laughs> Don't spend yeah. your time on necessary yeah. things. And, and the same goes for vertical slices right. in the reverse is if you're doing a vertical slice, you don't have to sit and spend three months building the real inventory system to vertical slice the inventory system. If you're vertical slicing the experience, you can cheat a lot of that. Instead of having a spawn system with spawn waves, have a like sequence that like will spawn the enemies at this moment exactly yeah. to prove what that sequence of gameplay will feel like so don't waste your time over egging developing a vertical slice it should prove that it's a good vertical slice of gameplay then you can go and build the, the systems and, and scale it out and yeah. you also want and to be careful that you never uh tell someone your prototype is a vertical slice 
um, because mm. your prototype's not, and they will no. have a very different opinion about yeah. it once they mess with You've it. You've implied this is how it'll look and feel yes. when you're done, which is <laughs> yeah. probably not what you're meaning to say. <laughs> and a vertical and actually, slice is a middle level of the game as well. Uh, you don't need to have all your tutorials leading up. You yep. can instruct yeah. people on how to play the game in a vertical slice because you're just showing them what the game look and feel will be and the gameplay. Um, too many vertical slices is at the first level, and that doesn't show me what your what your game is. Your vertical slice is something that's closed. It's where yep. you're going to have people interior playing it, and it doesn't. It shouldn't be the last level as well. It doesn't want to be where the mechanics are so ingrained. I've spent a hundred hours learning these mechanics. So I'm excellent at this game now. Now I can play through. Your vertical slice has to be playable from somebody in the industry. If, for instance, in AAA. One of the things we used to do with the vertical slice is we'd take a middle level, uh, we'd build it out to something that looked really gorgeous. It was indicative of what the game was going to be when we put it out there. The people that would play that vertical slice, our marketing would come in and play it because they have to know how to market and sell it to the retail and all the rest when it comes out. And they have to see where it fits into the industry in a whole uh, when it gets released. Uh, they And they will report back to some of the senior management who will prescribed to say yes the budget is fine to carry on moving with this game or no we've come back and we've seen these points that need to be changed to have market fit um so that's the sort of people that we look at with vertical slice in in the triple a uh, vertical slices sometimes are also used in the industry in the industry to uh, pitch or going into prediction production company and stuff like that uh, there is something that's very important to mention about the middle levels is that they usually describe how most of the game is going to go. There is only a v usually the longer the game goes, there is a shorter start and a shorter end compared to the middle. So this is why you'd choose a middle level over the end level or the starting. Uh, level yeah, it, because it, it, you want to make sure. Yeah, the the core gameplay loop and everything that's uh, going to be found in it through most of the game experience. You yeah. don't want to show someone the starting experience where they didn't unlock 90% of the mechanics of the game yet, for whatever reason, and then they'll say, oh, this sucks, there is nothing in it, it's bland, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, yeah, be careful about that. And it, also, it, uh, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, it's the same thing with, not, it's not just abilities and stuff, it's also about the narrative portions. Like, if, if you have, like, an opening linear portion with a boss battle and stuff, but that's not the, the main game is an open world run around with, like, these set sequences, don't vertical slice this experience that's not representative of what the game's actually going to play, like, 90% of the time. And to, um, there's a comment in here that vertical slice is often dangerous. A lot of times it's almost the entire game minus the polishing. That's not necessarily, it just... Vertical slice is representative of the gameplay experience. It, it just needs, it ultimately should represent um, pretty much everything in the game, but it's not like every, all those things are final or finish or yeah. whatever. Like it just needs to give you an idea experientially what, what this game is um, to the point of doing it in the middle of the game. Cause pretty much everything should have already been introduced or taught or whatever. And I can jump in and play it, but you know, spawning creatures here and there, that's not the final for that level necessarily or that experience or how the gun is firing or anything like that or what guns you might get there. Um, it just is, this is how I play this game. I jump in, I shoot guns, I jump around, um, I pop into my inventory and do this thing. All that stuff could basically not even be close to final at that point, but it represents what it is and, and where you're going to move forward. <laughs> yeah. So, Going on to uh, this slide... Oh, did you want to add to the vertical slice bit? You're... Uh, I want to talk more about prototyping and a video uh, that's pretty relevant, but go ahead. <laughs> I was going to talk about the slides, so I was going to move on to the bit. So you talk about this first. Okay. So uh, this is a video by Unity um, that's speaking specifically about best practices for uh, fast game design and prototyping. And they go through a lot here. This is a gold mine if you're uh, looking to make good prototypes and make it in a reasonable schedule. And I, I just want to highlight some very important points that we picked up in Relogic for it. Um, this talks about how to pick your right scope. And sometimes it may be way lower than you actually think it is. Uh, how to focus on the unknown and to identify specifically what you're actually trying to test in your test which is something I see a lot of things failing. And one of the comments also mentioned that um, one of the common uh, pitfalls of vertical slices is uh, you might end up making the entire game's worth of everything 
by just making the vertical slice, depending on your game. Be careful about that. You don't need everything. <laughs> um, Specifically, open world games are uh, kind of prone to this more than others because they might uh, want to implement all the mechanics ever and they might find new and new iterations to do. And at that point, they're just developing the full-blown game instead of just one mm. slice of it. So uh, yeah. it, it, one example is that you can limit the scope of what this section of the open world is going to try and do. Like this is a fighting slash stealth slash etc. instead of all of it. <laughs> um this is an amazing video, by the way. I've watched this. Yeah. Uh, everybody that's building video games should give this a watch. Yeah, and it also talks about how to keep things separate uh, so all the teams can work together and nobody is waiting on each other, uh, embracing failure, and um, faking it until you're making it is how they called it here. Basically making uh, things that just work but not necessarily are playable. Which that's, I, I yeah, found that, really that's what I was alluding to earlier. We, we call it cardboard demos, but it's the same principle. It's the idea that if your inventory has an upgrade system where you're like clicking in slots of special abilities into your powers, you only need to program the one or two that work. And you could kind of fake it with the rest of it as just images that are there. The implication is there's a lot of options. You don't need to go and make an entire modular super weapon system. Just make one gun so that when the weapon comes, you, you click the two things together and it proves the point with all the others. Just like limit how much work you're putting into those complicated yeah. systems. You can even get around that and making it feel like it's uh, proper by just locking it and say, this will be unlocked later. <laughs> Uh, a very neat trick. Um, other things are about uh, picking the right tools, which also is super uh, important, making sure you're not wasting time reinventing the wheel. There are a lot of tools that will automate a lot of art tasks for you specifically. Uh, so that's worth picking up. And also, this is why the entire asset store exists. It's pre-made solutions for things that you know you don't want to spend time on, like an inventory system. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I mean, even yeah. going to that inventory system, especially when you're doing something like a vertical slice, you can have, you, you're showing partway through the game, so you can fill the inventory up and just yeah. have a few things that are clickable in there, as Jason says, that are relevant to that bit of the uh, story and skip all the rest. Then you've got and again, same with waves and stuff. Yeah. Like, it, it's actually, this isn't, this isn't even just faking it, it's actually important to do this. If you've got a wave system where you have some smart AI that's spamming in enemies at different rates based on combat or something, don't write that. Just write a curve, a bunch of enemies that's hard coded in a list, and send them. And send them somewhere. Jason's. Oh, yeah, Jason gone. froze. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought this my entire internet. You know, was 300 gone. to ship the rest of the video. Yeah. <laughs> on, on that point, in Unity, you've got the timeline editor. Uh, the timeline enables you to fake a lot of stuff in gameplay. So I use, when I do a lot of vertical slices and prototypes and stuff like that, I use the timeline editor for an awful lot of that sort of thing uh, so that I can fake that bit and then make it into something else later on. Just have animations in your timeline editor. You can move them around and you can fire timelines at any time you want, basically. Uh, and it's a great way to fake a load of stuff in a prototype. And I linked a video from Unity exactly about that uh, in case anyone uh, wants to go through it later. But uh, it shows exactly how you blend uh, gameplay and storytelling with the timeline uh, as you need to, calling gameplay methods. And sometimes you can even uh, make shooter games with it where you control exactly how the enemies move. I do. I do. Yeah. I, make, I actually make uh, multiple timelines. Uh, so I have a game node system. Uh, and that each node in the game flow basically has time, can have a timeline associated with it. And when that timeline kicks off, it actually passes and does all the relevant information on that. So I use timelines throughout my games because I think they're awesome. Um, did we want to jump back into the slides? Yeah, yeah, I yeah. definitely yeah. do. Okay, Let's we can take pass a look at, at the. So, oh, we moved on. Well, that was oh, the end oh. of the Stop. vertical. There we right go. Here, we run this uh, so this bit, um, just to point out a couple of points in this one, uh, your alpha and beta in there, you've got target user tests and diverse user testing. Take note of this, people. User testing, getting it out in front of people is super important. And this with alpha and beta is the right way to do it with your target user tests and then your diverse user testing afterwards. So yeah, note it because the amount of times I have to talk to companies about it, it drives me nuts. Um, go and do it. 
Yeah, and do have active engagement with your uh, target users in your alpha stage because they will tell you things. Don't just ignore it and slide it off as it will be better in the beta. This is something yeah. that's going to be really difficult, but make sure to address feedback from your testers. Yeah, you got it's the the only odd little odd thing and a little pickup is you got concept and prototype in vertical slice, and then you got production. Production is the whole thing. Um, so if this is a stage, it's not really production as much. But yeah, uh, your audio you is can, it's uh, dying. Oh, okay. is it yeah, gone? Production was not on their main oh, thing. Your, your audio is better yeah. now. Okay, uh, this this stream's been weird today. Uh, but yeah, that's that's all I wanted to point out. Those bits you can you can jump on. Uh, but I also think, I mean, this might be nitpicky, but I think the alpha and beta, let's go back up. I think it's just like a super generic, improve all mechanics, implement all environments. Like, again, those are just like weird, I guess, just extra lines to say. And experience polishes, like, it seems like you'd be doing, I guess, more specific things. Improve all mechanics doesn't really mean much to me in alpha. Um, is that the only thing you're improving? Are you improving other stuff? Are you listening to feedback from people? Um, <clears throat> I might mention that specifically because um, improve all mechanics is just, it's super generic at alpha. Um, yeah, it is. And I mean, you could have it where you say target user tests and then from feedback from user yeah, tests, yeah. Implement, the, improve yeah. mechanics. I mean, implement all environments. You're on an alpha. Have you if you're not implemented all your environments when you're yeah, going out yeah. to an alpha, an alpha is your yeah. game. You're now testing that game to make right. those improvements on that game, do those last bits of polish, and then um, I'm into am it. I, am I back at all, by the way? Yeah. You're back. You're, you're back. back. Okay, you're back. cool. Welcome it's back. A bit, it's a bit stuttery on my side, too, but whatever. Uh, I just want to say one last thing on Vertical Slice as well we didn't really cover. This is just a tip for people making one. Um, a Vertical Slice is something you want people to play, obviously, and you might, you might bring it out in a demo. And so one of the biggest mistakes people make with vertical slices is they just have an open-ended chunk of their game. They drop a character in, hand them a controller, and walk away. You want it to be time-boxed. You want a like almost to the minute, five-minute demo that says you play the game, here, here's the controller, and literally at the end of five minutes, it'll like fade out and say thanks for playing or something. And that, that serves two purposes. One, it means the person playing knows their time's not going to be wasted. They're not going to feel that awkward moment of, can I give the controller back now? I'm kind of done. You're not going to get into that awkward, is this boring thing? And more importantly than all of that, you get to pitch your game as a roller coaster, which is what you want. You want it as it's as dangerous as the word is, and everyone gets scared about it. Uh, you want that demo to be scripted. I don't mean scripted as in some entirely fake thing altogether, but because it's a vertical slice, you want to control their experience. So if your game is going to have ramping difficulties of enemies, you can in a, in a demo. You can have a curve that literally spawns enemies that are increasing in difficulty. In the real game, it might be based on a level, and as the game plays out, they might level up and the enemies get harder. But you want the experience of that vertical slice to be representative, but controlled by you to sell what that loop will be. So time box it is very, very important. And it also uh, saves you from actually having to implement everything because the more time the person has, they might find more gaping holes in the experience that you're just trying to make sure they get. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And then it, it kind of goes both ways because if it's really important for you, the vertical slice might actually reveal very important things by those gaping holes. But what are you trying to get the experience or the actual, um, all the problems? Which you Definitely might better to let them get so. kicked out before they would get bored too. Just leave them wanting more. Get that really good effect there. Them wanting to play more, but the things over and asking when the next piece will be ready so they can play instead of leaving them in there until they're like, oh, that was fun. And now I'm bored and hand it over. And it looks like they've got the slice right here on another special bit. Link. Yeah, that's uh, just a cool. straight up link to their uh, HAO where you can download a build of the game, run it. Which is very cool. Yeah, and it shows that they're on time for their vertical slice. So <laughs> that's why the checkbox of having done that or a gun chart would have helped earlier. Mm -hmm. Go right there and just download it as of 13 days ago, it looks like. All right, so what slide are we on now? Partnership. I don't know what this is. Do you? This is this is the chapter page. You need to move to the next. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. It's not, yeah. Okay, so budget. 
140,000. Again, yeah, nice that they're including the links, showing that a mini preview, uh, 60k of funding, uh, will provide Exola, so right. by Exola, oh, sorry. Yeah, so they've got a portion of it funded already and looking to finish it. And it looks like they've got at least a, a sheet trying to figure out the costs. And how to, curious how that works out. And then the About Us, which actually talks about the studio. We had nine years of experience in the industry, which I think you guys kind of noted was pretty obvious and showed from their, their document already and the way that they put things together in the game. So any thoughts on this one or the... Uh, page before that nothing we've already we haven't already said about these little subheadings yeah. Yeah. yeah and what about these uh award sections you guys like these yes yeah that, it, it shows that you've already it's flaunted what you got to... yeah whatever yeah. you've got yeah. flaunted 100 yep no yeah. it, it, it's it's more than just flaunting what you've got it's also about proof that you actually yeah. show this to someone else and they approved of it which instead of just flaunting it, it's also proving it, it has more meaning than someone said this is good. It's someone actually tried this and said this is good. Yeah, it, big difference. You're asking for someone it, for money, then yeah, you're yeah, it qualifies you as a team. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, if I'm going to give you money, then this qualifies to say, yeah, we've done this. We we know what we're doing. Look, we've won these awards at it, and that's going to really push you forward. So yeah, absolutely. If you've got awards under your belt, I think I still talk about awards from frigging. 2001 or something that I've got. Hey, if I'm being honest, got I, I from the last century. If I'm being honest, I would have had these higher up. I, I, yeah, I would have had awards like thing. right up at the top. Here's my studio. Here's yep. what we've won. Here's our new idea. Why we're yeah. why you should listen to us, followed by what the project is. If you can sell me on who you are before you even get to the pitch, you'll do yep. a lot better. Yeah, I'd, I'd be putting this all over the place. But then, yeah. Bonding your experience. And yes, Jason, some from the 1900s. I, that's my favorite thing to, to talk about now with the kids. I'm like, yeah, that's from the 1900s. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, when I was in my 20s. Uh, oh, so old. Carry on. <laughs> All right. reminding me. You're going to play another that's boomer shooter? <laughs> yeah, boomer shooter. <laughs> Great. Love uh, it. International events. It's cool. It's showing them, it's showing off the game in a couple places, which I assume would be even more if it weren't for all, all the lockdowns and stuff lately. It's a good um, one. So I I do want to say that black text on the dark gray at the bottom left. Yeah, that was not shit. ideal. <laughs> Just yeah. Completely if you want someone, that. if you put text, it's for someone to read, and if you if it's for someone to read, make it easy to read. And this is actually text that works in your favor, so even more so. Very fair point. And then down here we've got oh more awards. Nice. And more scrots. I, I like um Jason's other earlier advice of the drop shadow on these images, though. I think that that would just polish these up a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And then more awards and more. And if you don't okay. want drop shadows, you can also do stickers because this looks like stamps on the paper. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Stylistic. So then we've got okay another one of the games. Some really nice looking art. Uh, here it's interesting because they actually put white outlines over every image. <laughs> oh yeah, I wonder if these were just pulled from that's somewhere else. How they, yeah, that's probably <laughs> just. <laughs> but yeah, but, but can you see? Yeah, immediately doesn't, doesn't that look more professional? Right? Does, like that yeah. shows the difference between that and yeah. the images above. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or even the images below where that, that doesn't hold anymore except for on one of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some more shots of projects and then some contact info. Okay. Yep. Yep. Tidy. So yeah, overall, and just one last one last thing too, just on a general artistic thing. If you're doing some kind of visual pitch like this, um, this is probably overkill for what you're doing here, but I would do it, is rather than just having a grid of images in one of these slides, I would go and make a full page image. I'd go to Photoshop, I'd pull these images in, and I would make a collage of an interesting, like I would cut at different angles, it would be a full interesting image, and I would put that in. I wouldn't just stick a bunch of images as like individual stuff, because it looks like you're just collecting a folder of art. If you look at proper um, sort of like... Uh, 
pitch, like it, like a visual pitch, you'll see a lot of it tends to have the images actually as part of the slide itself, not like added on top of it. It's hard to give an example unless I pull up some actual, um, you know, visual pitches. But basically, I would look into how to do this better because this compared to the, you've got really good details of information, but the images displayed here are, are not as artistically presented as you would expect from a visual pitch like this. How would you and, feel about like? An animated thing where they like kind of pop in, pop, 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 pop. Do you think that's useful for this type of stuff? It's a PDF. <laughs> oh, yeah. This is uh, right. this is a this isn't a deaf. This is nice. Yeah. 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 So, uh, what, right. one more thing that I do want to bring up though is that you probably want to put titles on this because, like Jason said, it's a collection of images you're putting, and I have no context as to why you're showing me these. If you had just put a yeah. name that says this is something we worked on, I could ask you questions about it. And this is where I'm probably at my most interested. You've already gone through the entire pitch with me. I already know most of what you want with this project. Now you're showing me this. Why are you showing me it to me? Probably just because you want uh, to show proofs of work uh, of what you've done. But you don't, you're not letting me ask you questions on these things because I don't even know their name. <laughs> Now, in this in in these specific ones, you actually have something uh, portrayed, but it's tiny, not easy to read, not clear text for it for this. And the other ones don't straight up don't have it. So, uh, and here's a oh yeah, I was going to jump in. If um, you've shown a lot of financials throughout this document, you've talked about how much you're going to make potentially with a fifteen dollar sale, with a hundred k, you know that's one million five hundred thousand. You're putting in this much money to actually generate it. You're raising this bit of money, and then you're showing projects you've actually done. The one thing I would do as a businessman is I turn around and go, "That's great. How much have you made from these projects? How much did you spend on them? What did you overspend? How what did you learn from them?" If you're quite heavy on financials and you don't have to put them on the slides, by the way, for your previous financials, if you're trying to get it up, you're a business after all. But I will be asking you that as a company. I will turn around and say, you're pitching me this game. I'm going to invest in you this much. I expect this much in return. What have you made previously on other games? So, yeah, just to be aware of that, that's going to come up. Well, it should come up if they're doing their due diligence properly. <laughs> Yeah, I and guess it's also something you can just you. brag about anyway. If you if you did make a good bit of money, it's another thing that you can put in there as a bragging point. <laughs> yeah, and if you're if you made any sort of levels, like a lot of times I talk about, oh yeah, I've had a number one game with the iOS, I've had a number one game on Android. Uh, we had twenty million concurrent users on one of these games, and I'm talking about from previous yeah. stuff that I've done. Those things come up in when I go and talk to other people about games that I'm going to concept for them or games I'm going to pitch to them. I talk about, yeah, this game came out, number one on iOS, number one on Android. we done the follow-up game with this, number one on iOS, number one on Android, and then our concurrent users went up from this to this because we pitched the, pre the new game in the previous game and we had follow-on marketing and all the rest, and we built community audience to carry on. If you're putting games out there, nowadays especially, uh, one of the things I ask is, you know, what's your community follow on? Well, how how are you building on the previous games you've put out there? Uh, what are you going to do with this game? Are you going to link it in previous games? Are you going to go and do all the rest of that sort of thing? Are you going to go on Steam and say, you know, this was this game and we, these are the previous games we've done? I'm going to look at your community follow on because I know that's going to create more revenue for you. So. It's good to have that sort of thing. So if your games achieved any sort of, if they were in a top 10, they were featured, any of that sort of thing, show that on your slides. That's super important to me. Nice. Well, um, hopefully that was helpful feedback on these these pitch docs. I think we could probably do this again with some more docs and maybe go over trailers or something sometime too. Um, do you guys have any other final thoughts on that? I don't want to cut anybody off if there's anything else you guys want to share about that. But if not, I'm just going to start giving away a, co a copy of Rider. So anyway, um, the last thing um, I did is I, I, I did a quick, literally Google search, just very quickly found a random one. I haven't even looked at it much, but I put a link to an example of some other PDF thing someone's done as a pitch. And I only bring it up to show one thing is just look at how the images are integrated into the um, document. Okay, let's, let's pull that one up real quick. So this is just purely what I was saying, is rather than having a grid of images, just notice how the images are being used to augment the information, and it's displayed as part of the document. It's just a generally good idea. If you've got lots of images like that, they're a presentation in and of themselves. 
So you can okay, just press yeah. the arrows back and forth there. Yeah, you see what I mean? Like the images, the way they're presented as part of the slides Very are nice. a lot more, yeah, are a lot more professional looking than just having images on a grid. Just something to think about when you're producing something like this. Um, do you want to play the trailer, Jason, just to... To reply to one of the uh, things somebody put up there, the ball wrote, what if my mum said the game was good? Uh, my reply to that, is your mum going to buy all 100,000 copies of the game? If so, then, yeah, it's a, it's a good chance that your mum is relevant to this. Or, or even half, because then you can say one person bought half of these games. <laughs> it's kind of weird. <laughs> and it wasn't my mum. I, uh, so something I do want to mention is uh, thank you again for just sharing this entire thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was a genuine treat to watch, and... We, I do hope the feedback was useful. It was uh, great for me to see that to compare to other things because now I can say, oh, actually, someone else did this. And mm -hmm. Some of these things were exemplary. So yeah. thank you. Yeah, it's good. Nice. Well, here, let's pop up. I'm going to put a link to the trailer in there and then um, we'll just play through a, a, a sec. A couple, I don't know if I can get audio through here, though, if I'm trying to play that. So. Yeah, I'm going to hear it. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Hi. Three minutes. Bearable. It's a pie. <laughs> and by the way, three minutes is a very good time limit for a trailer. Yeah. Wait, it, it, it links to a pitch deck. Like a little preview shot, the experiment. Definitely reminds me a lot of inside. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm getting a lot Nothing, of this. Oh man, I, I would love to spend an entire hour breaking this trailer down. There's just so many like interesting, both really well done and a couple of things that need tweaking. But it would be great so much of it. So I, I, I've actually been watching the entire thing and putting uh, an emphasis on the time second. Every single moment the scene changes. See how long it took. Uh, I do have a question about the game there. <laughs> About, about what? About I had a question or a point about the gameplay that it isn't coming through on the deck, but it might come through in other stuff. Um, but we can finish though. We can talk about it first. It's interesting. Yeah. It definitely well, cuts really well. I like how it's cutting on the beat too. And what happened to the kid? Oh, you have to buy the game to find out. Uh -oh. <laughs> she's gone. Maybe she's in the backpack. Oh. I hope not, because that speaks to a whole different storyline. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was going to get in the crate there and start moving with the crate on top, and I was like, no. <laughs> Oh, we're using footage. Not a good yeah. idea. Not yeah. a good idea. Very big red flag. <clears throat> so, okay, there, there's I, definitely I, I, some really important notes about this uh, one, but you go first, because this yeah. is a good one. Uh, so, uh, one thing I want to bring up from a gameplay perspective, it took two minutes until we saw anything other than walking, which... 100%. Not yeah. ideal. Mm -hmm. I also thought it was over before it was over and stopped sharing. <laughs> no, I'm so... So just as a general, if you are making a trailer for your game, check out Derek Liu's YouTube channel. First thing first, because one thing you'll learn as you're going through this is your trailer is a story, like any trailer for any movie, and you're trying to sell what the story is. And so you're trying to get beats across of what you're talking about. The first beat is what the gameplay is like. How many shots of walking right do we need to know that there's stealth, right? I, I immediately got that three in. I would have had three or four quick cuts, and it would have been... Beat, beat, beat. Okay, this is a stealth across multiple areas. What's the next thing? Next, in your trailer, 
you've obviously got points where you play as the daughter, as the father, and as both. Why not put that into a story? Like, you, even in the trailer, if you're going to give that away already, imply it in some arc where it shows them either, shows them together, then show him. You know what I mean? Like, structure it into something that, like, if you're going to write your, your text in between, structure that as the beats of the story. And then next, each beat should do something. It should tell you, first there's stealth, then there's a part where you might be sick or in trouble, then there's a part where, you know what I mean? There's a structure the narrative of what that trailer is and and as separately from that from a cutting perspective you have 90 percent of the shots walking right and in the middle one of the shots walking right to left that massively messes with your eye line when you're watching the trailer you need to follow your eye across the trailer of how people are uh looking at it and then as for the text fading up and down too that was way too long at the start there is a lot of of delay on those texts that don't need to be there, right? It, it's it's a visual medium. Show it visually. They're the main like points for me. Um, yeah, it could be. Um, I mean, you haven't got enough stuff for a three minute trailer yet until you've got gameplay with people playing it, or else it leaves that yeah. alone. It could and be. It doesn't have to be. be boiled one, to minute, one, minute, one minute, a tight yeah, one minute trailer. One minute trailer. So yeah. much better. Yes, yes. That's what I was about to say. Yeah, one minute trailer. That's all you need for that. I think it um, might be. I that just they have one question to... about their gameplay um, in their deck. Um, they focused on the daughter being blind and so for me if it seemed like her being blind there would be like some very particular reason why you're focusing on blind as a gameplay like the father has to call her she has to follow sound but that that um trailer makes me think that blind isn't a thing um her running from three guys just openly i don't know how she's doing that she's following the father without having to touch him um things like that that seem like you're focusing on blinds capitalized, I think, in a couple spots in the PDF um, to kind of imply that there is this like really significant reason why this is here. But that doesn't really come across as like a particular gameplay thing. So I'm very curious why you're focusing on her being blind. And and in the trailer, I don't think blind is even mentioned um, mm. uh, at all. It's just I'm a father protecting my daughter, which is fine. Like that's enough. Like that is enough of a compelling point for me. Uh, to get across i think the, the name of the game fatherhood um but you mentioned blind so many times i was looking for something there to to reinforce that particular concept because it seemed like it's another compelling point that add complexity in, in in the gameplay yeah and in the gameplay it looked like you played as the door yes at some yeah. points yeah. and yet you could still see everything yeah it seemed like you could she might be using yeah. some some her heightened senses of some sort, but that doesn't come across. And the experimental you thing you need to like portray that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I did have that I, problem when the daughter's walking behind the father and they're not holding hands. Yes, and somehow yes. she's following every turn he's taking. So yeah. if you if you're selling that as a point of the gameplay, that particularly took me out of it. Because I'm thinking about oh, like I, Ico or something like that, where you like run off and you have to call to her, and she, mm, she's not mm, blind. But mm, I was thinking some something like that might be some type of gameplay that they would be trying to reproduce. So I I do want to pitch in its potential protection. It might just be that uh, the portrayal is still weak in the trailer, but it might just be for the sake of game mechanics slash budget that they focus on the story when you play her and it's not necessarily a strong presentation on purpose. But it is something to bring up and say, well, um, was this implemented properly? And uh, this comes across a bit weak here, but... The, the trailer took about 40 seconds of just walking at the start, and I think this was to present a specific mood. I do agree there was no content for uh, three whole minutes, but I think it tried taking 40 seconds, at least at the start, just to set up a mood of specific type, because if it was one minute, it would not be able to establish it necessarily easily. Remember, this is a pitch and not a full-blown trailer for release, so... Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and so one of the questions in the chat was, how do you solve that walking right, walking left thing? There's a rule in film called the 180 degree rule. And it means that when you're telling a story, you've got multiple characters and multiple camera angles. And if you ever, you always want to move less than that 180 between turns so that the, the people are always in the same position relative on screen. If you flip 180, then you end up with this weird scenario where the person you are tracking mentally on the right is now on the left and it kind of messes with you. So the answer to that is imagine a red laser pointer right at the center of your eyes when you're watching your own trailer and then track where that is. If you want to go one step further, get an eye tracker and look at the heat map afterwards of where your eyes went. And you'll notice it, it follows fine sometimes. Other times it'll flick back and forth and it starts to get jarring. Watch professionally cut trailers and you'll notice your eyes tend to sort of 
follow, a center point. It zooms in on footage here, it zooms out, draws your eyes over here, it zooms in and out. Your eyes will never really change. Um, the focus is always where your eye is. If you want to cut to a scene where a character is heavily on the right, you have to first move their eye in the previous scene from center to the right, then make the cut so their eyes in the right position on the next cut. So there's more than just like frames of, of the gameplay. You can zoom in on the frame. Like you could zoom in and do a cropped footage and then use, you know, go back and forth in a smaller frame and use those movements to draw eye lines back and forth. So in short, and, eye lines should matter most with cuts like yeah. that. And I do want to point out that what you just said is completely important even in just raw gameplay, regardless of the trailer stuff. Um, this is actually a big problem in mainly action games where you do want the focus to move smoothly. And this is why a lot of teleportations effects, dashes, etc., etc., will portray a lot of uh, visual cues to make your eyes wander in the right direction immediately instead of just, oh, the enemy is on completely the other way now. And... Etc. And you could do this in the trailer with all those shots that you already had, but just add something on top, like a visual effect or text that moves uh, as the things go. And separately from that altogether, like if you, if again, if you're directing a trailer, there's other tips, which again, it's not, that's not what it was for, but you're looking for points of interest in a story. So if you've got, if you've got a foreground where they're sneaking past soldiers and there's a big building in the background, Later on, you can show them closer to that building because the same building's in shot from a different angle or they're actually on the building or something. There's the, the continuity of what you're doing with your story. And you'll see this in games like um, Last of Us, where at all times they make a point of whatever your current objective building is, you can see it. It's, behind, it's somewhere there within your line of sight as you exit and enter areas to remind you what your point of interest is. So same with the trailer. Like... If it's just arbitrarily walking around, why are people walking around? But if they're walking around and even in the trailer, you could see the objectives to get to or from something or with, with the character with the daughter, then maybe she's not there or is there. But if, but the implication is, is she is she sick and you're going to get medicine or is she kidnapped and you're going to rescue her? Whatever that is, you can you can imply something with the cut of the trailer as to why there's a narrative to what's going on and keeping visual points of interest as well as narrative points of interest is important in selling that story. I have a question. Yeah. What's the question, Salim? Um, how come I am not eligible to win my one-year writer license? I mean, you didn't write your name. Did you choose your character? I chose Salim, yes. The ultimate character. So, Salim is not a, a monster yet. Somebody's going to have to make me a character. Salim model. Now, if I can get a Salim model, I will, without a doubt, pop that in here <laughs> and have you fighting against demons and rats and treasure chests and stuff. I think that would be hilarious. If anybody is an artist and wants to make a Salim model real quick, <laughs> oh, oh, there's a cool out there. Who wants to do that? Or knows how to do some cool art tools and, and make a good Salim model. That should be the art. That should be the next giveaway of Ryder, the best Salim model, as the best by the judges here. <laughs> I would be surprised if there isn't somebody out there who's already made a Salim model in the past. You can just Why send it over to me. What are you trying to imply about my past? <laughs> <laughs> you know a lot gorgeous? of artists, and I, I bet one of them has decided to screw with you before. <laughs> I mean, that's talker to <laughs> NFT. <laughs> yeah, I've worked through groups of artists before. They will do mean things to you on your birthday. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> learn art if you're in the industry it's your only it's the only way to fight back so yeah anybody who wants to enter to win it looks like we're up to 100 contestants right yeah. now if you want to enter to win just type in any one of those night lizard rat werewolf form chest when are we doing this when we demon beholder and i'll hit the button in a few minutes we'll right. hit it and just get it get uh, it started so to get through it <laughs> Yeah, that it ends by the end at the end of the stream, and we'll just take some questions and stuff while we go through. So give everybody like another minute or so to enter and hit the thumbs up button and share. And if you want to change your character, now is your last chance for that too, because as soon as I start, you can't switch. Wait, so do you, you have? Hey, by the way, that, that, that no? random idling needs to be done here too. By the way, it, it's it's making my eyes twitch that everyone is dancing in perfect unison. <laughs> oh yeah, I did it for the battles. The battles have a, an animation delay, but the um. Mm. The sideline, I didn't think about that yet. <laughs> I've just been spamming hit at random. All right. So oh. Uh oh. 
they they got Jason earlier. Now they got the Jason. Oh dear. <laughs> oh, this is no. where he has a Unity crash. And I think I'm getting an internet problem. Again. Oh, you're back. I think. Yeah. yeah he's okay. Back. His uh, Unity feed isn't, but you're back, Jason. Oh, okay. My internet, yeah, seemed to uh, to drop out for a second. It was right when the wife went out the front door, the internet dropped. Strange mm. coincidence. Huh? So, right, question is, uh, for you, Jason. Um, yeah. If Unity happens to crash while you're doing this, does everybody have to resubmit who they no, want? No, just gonna it'll reread the entire chat. Oh, good. Yeah. So it'll that. it'll actually go back through the chat, reparse it all, and it'll just re-add everybody in the exact same order and switch them back to their right classes. That was one of the things I was worried about. If if I hit the button or paused it or messed up or whatever, mm. crashed it. Um, luckily, I haven't had many crashes, so it hasn't been an issue. But um, implying yeah, a number recover. above zero. <laughs> <laughs> so, are you guys uh, ready? Should I hit the button and get it started? Yeah. Did everybody enter? Did you guys all enter? Yeah, I am. No. I, ent- I entered as Celine. Yeah, I tried <laughs> it earlier and it just didn't do anything. Oh, it did it for me. I'm already a winner. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you should have tried it a minutes ago after we added the Saloon character. Oh, damn. Yeah, Sorry. Oh, I'm going to put that in there as an option. It's just going to be something weird. It's going to be the. You know, I've been playing with ponies lately, a pony game for the little one. It's Nothing just going to be that. a little pony. Nothing you say Saloon and you get a little pony. Make it the bullet tree. <laughs> Saloon the right. unicorn. <laughs> Yeah. All right, last Definitely. call for entries. You got about two seconds to say something in chat, and then I'm going to hit the button, which means <laughs> that by the time this goes out, it's already too late. Because two seconds has already like happened. A, you're, you're at least like time. a 15-second chat delay. <laughs> All right, here we go. Let's see what we get. And closing entry. I see I even added a little countdown to scare everybody. One crush. Oh, no, it happened. There you go. <laughs> Yay. I love it. Right. And the <laughs> fight has begun without the fancy health bars. So let's see who wins between. Oh, I forgot the order gets randomized. I was going to say, I thought it was going to be me and Jason right at the front, but I added a little thing to randomize the uh, the first fighters. Oh, and I messed it up apparently by manually adding a fighter. I can see myself bugged out underneath there. Well, uh, more things to work on. Speaking of, how long did you yeah. spend on this this week? This week, not long. It, when I work on it, it's usually like an hour, a little hour Jason's or two. Jason's story's up. Jason's story's up. Oh, wait. Like, James, you're going down. Oh. He's right here. What the heck? Go store, story and James. Oh, what's that about going work? down? Oh. Oh. Oh, oh so one and two. Oh, oh. Wow. oh. <laughs> Rigged. Rigged. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, two I, I was never scared. It was all for drama. Just making it more fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. Yeah, but when I work on it, it's usually like an hour or two. I'll have an idea. I'm like, you know what I want to do? Go add this thing to it. And I'll just jump in and go add in the, the next little feature. The next thing that I want to do was um, with navigation. So I want to make the characters actually walk into their battle spots, walk along the sides and stuff, instead of just kind of poofing and popping at the next frame into position, make it feel a little bit more alive i guess like there's characters yeah. just running around the area and then make them run off and back up there when they win or something you so, could probably just do a twin lerp them uh or make some curve but you know they have them. do jump right i literally have a high ground yeah. there i just do jump them from yeah. one spot to another and one hop you know? um i would i don't know how editable this arena is but i'd get rid of those uh that little uh doorway on the side there and the the uh, statue on the left that's like blocking the people up top and just make those walls flat. Um, so you're not like clipping the name into the, into the, uh, that's a good idea. You know who has access to this project? Who? It's going to be Salim awesome. in a second. Oh, <laughs> right. This this is actually just um from the Sinti dungeon pack. I think it was like their default dungeon. I just uh, grabbed a spot that looked like a good arena for a, a base spot. And then, I think one of you guys pointed out the rafters. I think that was you, Salim, that pointed out putting characters in the rafters gave me the idea. But yeah, I think that that would make a lot of sense. Fix up this level and make it nice and pretty. Yeah, yeah. so maybe an artist should have access Ooh, to Jason Wyman. To the this project. is definitely rigged. <laughs> oh, shit, I won. <laughs> <laughs> Casually not even mentioning it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, the final on that battle point, is just, just the lame. The final battle uh, uh, is just Jason would be allowed. Good. You should have Denise join. She would have won it all. Oh, she doesn't want a rider license, though. So. <laughs> <laughs> then she can just give it to me. Oh, fair enough. All right, here you go, Salim. I don't know what this is, but you can have it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Where, where are you at? Are you, it's a shame you're not in the battle. I don't see any of you guys in here. Oh, Somebody yeah, I'm going to get rid of all these little menu items up there, too. Somebody mentions mm. that they need to see your editor screen to make sure you're not rigging the objects. You see, the jokes oh. are new because they don't have to show it in the editor. It could be in the source code. <laughs> yeah, uh, it could definitely be in the source. I am um, sharing the source. I put up two copies yeah. of it so far, and I put up another one. I can't share the art, obviously, because it's, it's not mine, but the actual code for it. I've been kind of trying to share and make public. Well, it's a lot harder now because it's become not one file and becoming an actual... Well, semi-real project but not as bad well it's, it's, all, it's all the source apart from that one class that says if jason one po- <laughs> equals 1. <laughs> 1.5 1. times <laughs> yeah it's the damage uh, modifier for jason's yeah. if your name oh. starts with the J A. if we're talking about <laughs> uh, proper code architecture though we could just isolate it into its own module and then the, the, the core combat uh classes on their, their oh, yeah. namespaces and then show that. Yeah, uh, and technically the combat is is literally like a single method. It's so freaking basic. Like, there's, there's not a lot to it. It's it's very, very simple. The majority of the code is just in grabbing players from YouTube, putting them in the right position, and uh, making them look right. Yep. And then it's all presentation and making things pretty, which we can do a lot of. I still want to get rid of those two lights at the bottom. They take away from the focus on the main arena. <laughs> oh, okay. one of our pitchers made it through. Fairway Evil. So, oh, oh cool. Nice. This reminds yeah, me of. The... Hmm? Good. I just wanted to say this reminds me of that meme of uh, kids watching uh, a fight going, <laughs> and just like, yeah, <laughs> all excited. <laughs> Watch the video game. We're going to watch people not play a video game now. Mm-hmm. Watch people watch a video game. So here's something interesting. Are these names uh, oh, part of the Unity imagination. UI? Uh-oh. Oh, right. Uh-oh. We need to get a warped imagination versus Jason story. That's what no, we need. he's blatantly going to have a modifier in there that says warped imagination multiplied by 0. 0.2. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing pretty good for that multiplier. Oh, oh okay. This is sorry, definitely why. rigged. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've all gone through. Oh. Well, I didn't. <laughs> oh, didn't you? Did you get knocked out? No, I didn't even get the end. <laughs> oh, here we go. Second I didn't. Round. I didn't. Jason's story's going to lose. Oh, oh, no. The did health, you see that health 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 now oh. to 100%, but I didn't oh. fix the... Um, there's a bug in the UI where it doesn't show but the health. Nobody saw that. Nobody saw that. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, it does look like video. Jason Story's a big cheater, though. Oh, oh no, he's dead. He's he dead. died. Yeah. The yeah, UI doesn't show the health that one, that you one. take damage. There was... that, that was a cover-up. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it, it doesn't update your health bar until you've taken damage. The regen doesn't actually update oh, your health yeah, bar. Fix that. Everybody's going to 100 afterwards. I got rid of the... Um, good, good. The, Isn't it crazy how that guy with a name exactly like mine just got knocked out? It's crazy, but a good thing I'm still there, though, right? Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> your your other name, uh, Joris Van. What does that say? I can't even read it. Martinell. Martinell is you. Sorry. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> so here's a technical question: How do you present these names in this project? Are they in World Space? Are they UI in uh, following World Space? So uh, they're world space canvases the that, on the objects at the moment, aren't they? Yes. The way that I've done it, it initially, um, it was set up with just some characters in the middle, and it'd swap it out, and then there was a world space canvas. Um, what I've done afterwards, when I decided that I wanted these characters to kind of hang around and persist in the world when they're not fighting and maybe do other things like interact with chat and stuff, I decided to just turn them into full-on. Op- they're just prefabs for each player. So each player gets a battler prefab that has a canvas with just a world space you underneath it. 
and then that canvas is just looking at Jason the Wyman now. dead. Jason Wyman oh, just no! died. Yeah, yeah but Jason, on, let's restart this fight. Jason like didn't get hit left. for like almost the entire fight. <laughs> yeah, I know. And then just one shot. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, we're gonna, it's like, it's like gambling like at a casino. We, we we basically were going to try to go to the end to win it, but once everyone called us out, it's like okay, press the press the button. Oh man, the Funny giveaways is, for a rider license, oh, right, Jason? <laughs> yes, yes. So we're gonna give away whoever wins gets a one year rider license, and thanks to JetBrain for sponsoring. We've been sponsoring uh, podcasts with rider licenses. It's amazing. Well, um, we have established that whoever wins rider license, then you get like a married rider, rider license that goes to Salim, right? Oh, Andrew's dead. Andrew, the treasure chest. Yes, yeah, I believe that's what we decided. You're supposed Actually, to win, but you keep failing to enter correctly. Well, I so promote one of the wins. So, oh, uh, warped imagination. <laughs> uh, I'm going to win this. Uh, See, see that cheat? Uh, <laughs> How did his bar just jump up halfway through the fight? Oh, this because is- he got hit. He finally got hit. It was his first hit. <laughs> that, that self destruct button I do not like. <laughs> oh, well. oh, what is this? <laughs> is it, is it good be thing, a rat? It's a good thing right, Jason's we, still we in. Could, we could stop watching this now and move on to the next topic. No, uh, I'm out. I lost. <laughs> no, no. Jason's story still oh, in. Stor- oh, story still no, in? There. Yeah, right Story's there. Martin L. Martinell is Jason Story. Yeah, oh, you my name wrong. Martin is now Jason. <laughs> <laughs> Martin, you've, you've been turned into Jason Story. <laughs> uh, yeah, Squid Games. That's what you should call this. Uh, Squid Games. <laughs> Just change the title on YouTube. Game Dev Games. Dev I think games. if you put Squid Games on anything on YouTube right now, it, it goes to the front page. This is true. Well, no, you're about a week or two <laughs> too late. But it's it's Dev Games. There you go. You got the, uh, <laughs> the project and everything. Definitely got to fix that health bar issue, though. Yes. I guess when to put in Jason's new health bar that he uploaded. Honestly, Damn. something that really should oh be God, done here is moving the VFX every time someone gets hit to the person who got hit. Because right now it's always in the middle and you have to watch the health bars instead of the units. Oh, actually, the VFX, they're even worse than that. I grabbed <laughs> one particle for each character and I dragged it on as a child. And then whichever character is on, it just finds the particle that's a child and plays it. So each character only plays one particle based on whether they got if, their model, pretty much. And they're just positioned terribly. So it's not so much, it's really just bad positioning of the objects. Well, I mean, things to do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's faking it till I make it. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Do a lot of the, a lot of the fake stuff. Oh, we're down to five five extra people, nine people fighting so far. Or yeah, we're thirteen. Almost there. Let's see. I guess we'll see who wins soon. I like that the rafters are emptying up. It'd be nice if we could just kind of jump back in. It is too late to join in. Um on this one, but you definitely can join in on the next week. And I might do a little bit of experimenting. If any of you guys want to do some streaming this week, maybe we can stream and modify it and make it better and then uh, do another experiment with people live and let everybody join in, add in some more cool features. I, I really want to add power. I got an idea for you, but it's a surprise. Is okay. it bullet trees again? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> and time rewinding? <laughs> time rewinding is such a complex topic, actually. <laughs> <laughs> all right we're down to the last five fighters oh and if anybody wants a free headache uh try making a cyclical coordinate system so that oh, uh God. what <laughs> yeah i'm just gonna leave that there because that's been my week just, just saying cyclical coordinate <laughs> system gives you a headache oh man <clears throat> just a free headache right there Oof. all right who's gonna win this one it's like, oh man, this is close. Oh, wow! Well, <laughs> Everybody almost died. I'm wait, glad I have the full health three. regening in here. All right, semifinals of the second to last battle. Oh, what? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <I'm rigged>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <I'm so> <laughs> he went out there to fight himself. Okay, if it if it ends with just two people, I'll just manually add them and we'll restart it with them. So, got- so the topic for next week will be QA. Uh, <laughs> oh hey it worked oh okay you got away with that the last Connor, match should be in the center up. the last match should just uh, replay oh, yeah. itself to the center I agree 
Actually, the last two matches should just offset more towards the center. Yeah, oh. yeah it needs to move. Damn. Yeah, the camera like should back. zoom oh. in. Yeah, camera should zoom yeah. in. There you go, Crofty. A cinema machine right there. If just only you guys had oh, access yeah. to the code. And then the winner should walk <laughs> to the middle no? of the arena. You're just really like, busy. You cheer. know how many projects I've got <laughs> to go. <laughs> Next winner. I'm just talk trying to offer a bitch on to you guys. <laughs> 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 Well, congrats, Raphael. I'll um, send you over the code uh, right after we finish the stream. So congrats, the winner. Uh, get your Rider license and enjoy it. It's huge. I, I really love Rider. I've been using it for a couple years now, and I would never switch back. So, yeah, if you won and anybody who does win or just decides to go give it a try, I guarantee you're going to love it if you're a Unity developer. It's just the best, I think, for writing code. Um well, that was fun. Yeah. <laughs> we'll have to definitely have to put in some more code in there and then share it a bit more so everybody can go in and see how to build their own and how to do the YouTube integration stuff too. Hopefully you guys got some ideas for YouTube integration, like ways to make it more interactive and fun without it making it cheaty. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot to be done. <laughs> <sighs> I have to go on vacation right. next week, so maybe I can uh, jump in and have some fun. <laughs> well, I mean, so, since you already got the system for uh, interpreting the text into characters, you could also let them choose special abilities now and actually yep. implement them. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, it, it it sounds like a lot of feature creep, but you can make it really, really simple if you just make some, you know, simple plus one attack, plus one, yeah. plus zero point one attack speed, and mm -hmm. make it. Give them some a bit more health, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It might be cool can... to do like an auto battler style mana ability system too, where they just get mana every time they attack, and then they fire off they whatever their ability is when they get to the max. They just like do some kind of cool effect. So like you know, once they've capped it yep. out, they get an effect. So, so I I would uh, prioritize making it simple so everybody can make their choices from the start. And yep. while mana sounds nice, it's uh. It's a bit of a rabbit hole because once you have a resource, you now need to manage that resource, find ways to use that resource, and then those uh, resource usages need to be impactful enough. Uh, honestly, and, I think a really simple yeah. way of making it strategic but straightforward is just have a rock, paper, scissors weighting system. So you have four classes. Each class has a 10% buff against another one of the other type. And then you pick your character and you pick the class they're associated with. And then that gives you some level of control over, you know, kind of yeah, stuff so, you're up against. So what yeah. I wanted to say is, while while that works, it's still just the basic ability that you get at the start, which like I'm better against this, worse against that. But if you want to make it more strategic, you would have uh, spread out choices made in advance. So once I'm level one, choose these buffs. Once I'm uh, round three, choose these buffs. Round five, choose these buffs, etc. And then we can see builds actually forming and things actually happening uh, in a more personalized manner. And also, if we put proper shaders on them, we could let people customize their colors. So I think a good first iteration could be just taking what Jason had and then allowing them to change in between rounds. Right? And they're making decisions each round, at least switching characters. It, yeah, because between the, the different rounds, be you have different weights. Yeah, That'd be interesting, because like, there'd be 40% of the people who made it through round one are fire, therefore it's probably preferential to pick water for next round, but those people might switch too, and you end up getting into interesting stuff. And they'll all be watching chat and fighting over choosing the alter. <laughs> you're, you're the, changing is, uh, it is the goal of this for it to be that interactive? I thought like the goal was to just kind of place your bet at the beginning and see and see what happens. I think it's better to, to have kind of a back for blood concept where I just choose the order of my deck and then cards roll out everything. And then of course, in back for blood, you have to pick what one of your five cards that pop out. But I think you're just kind of projecting that as this level gets harder or goes on, I want this thing to be available. So I like the concept of actually, they, there the you go. Car abilities. Cards are a great idea, right? Because what you could do is you could just have jump means you, you don't get attacked by your next hit. Attack doesn't attack, defend defends, and you you only take 70% of the damage or or 30% or of the damage or something and you end up having a bunch of cards and like you said if you stack your deck as jump jump attack attack jump is your sequence you're up against someone else and you try to do whatever sequence you do you could have something where it's still random because you don't know what the other guy's going to pick but at least you've you, you've made your bed once you've picked whatever your sequence is you know everybody's just going attack 100% of the time 
I like. Well, yeah, obviously, I like there's weights. Like you'd have to have limits. Here. Like attacking multiple times would be lower yeah. damage. You know, there'd be some obviously yeah. balance it right. That's very clearly. Yeah. You know? But I like what you just posted here, Jason. That they should pick a patron saint <laughs> from the dev group. That's, <laughs> that's really tiny. Everybody, oh, oh, I have to decide. Yourself. Have to decide between us who gets what. <laughs> yeah, you see it for some now. <laughs> so, so you say this I mean, Jason's story's you... got to have a critical hit. I mean, that's just that's got to be there. It's just, he, he has crit hit going on. It's like Dark Souls. You pick your god as you go in, and I think that you get buffs relative. <laughs> I'm feeling I'm going to get nothing accomplished all week and just be adding yeah. in patron saints now. But we can actually drag you into being productive with our uh, new Discord. <laughs> yeah. <Conversations. laughs> Probably. Yeah, just, Maybe he'll drag us down instead. We'll see. This does seem like a neat idea, though. I like the idea of figuring out some sort of waiting thing there, and then just based on how many people are alive in that group. That'd be fun. So uh, next week, we're going to talk about uh, feature creep and uh, feature peaches again. <laughs> feature creep is the way to go. And when you're having fun with it and, and you don't have a deadline, it's a lot easier to feature creep. I mean, Better than a real project. <laughs> you could definitely do the rock, paper, scissor thing pretty simply. I think I think it's just a, like if you ever played Sukaden, um and when you did the castle battles, the, the one-on-one fights were all just you pick you know, your rock or paper or scissor, and then they would just play up an animation and whoever won, won did damage. That could be an interesting thing. And you just pick your whatever one of three cards to play every round or something like that. Just, I mean, it's purely guessing. It's purely random. Uh, but it could be an interesting just thing to, to play because you just some cool animation and some some cool effects happens when the two things happen, when two things clashes. Yeah. And we could just do weapons. Done. It's as simple as that. Just like weapons, sword and shield. And yeah. Two That's a good way to represent it. Two weapons, right? Get yeah. your rock, paper, scissors. They pick their character and their weapon yeah. set. And, then... and the nice thing about that is if, you know, if it's visually consistent, then yeah, when I go up against a guy with a spear and I've got a dagger, oh crap, like I'm at a disadvantage here. So it's kind of obvious. Um, Unless you're a treasure chest. Right? So next then up, treasure chest with great daggers. swords. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, so... the core problem there is that you're introducing complaints about balance and all kinds of goofy stuff, even yeah. though they go into it knowing that it's randomized. Um, so even though it is simple, it's like, or something that's supposed to be kind of fun and like you know what we could do. We can put everyone's name in a list, right, and then just randomly pick a name from the list, mm -hmm. and then it's done instantly, and there's no, no <laughs> difficulty. At all. That sounds far too boring. <laughs> so the vertical slice will be uh, 2023 Q4. <laughs> the alpha will be a couple of years after that, and then all the bugs. API. <laughs> Yeah. QA is the audience, obviously. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Attendance. It's to be the way it happens, yeah. yeah. Maybe you should have a show, uh, just one of the shows on production. and how to... This is part of the uh, strategic uh, layout yeah. uh, for cutting costs on QA. <laughs> well, you see, if anyone asks, I said I'm, I'm claiming the role on this project as product owner, which means I get to come up with whatever ideas I want and have no culpability <laughs> for whether they're possible or can be done. I just make ideas. So... I'm not actually, it's not, Feature Creep's not my fault. I'm just giving ideas. It's not my problem if it gets done or not. You're just doing the hard part of coming up with all the ideas. <laughs> exactly, yeah. The valuable part. Yeah, right? that's too difficult. <laughs> uh, that's like, that's why you only industry. want 90% of the revenue, right? Well, 92, we're going yeah, to get 10% sure. of the market, so, you know. Yeah, And you're obviously going to get Marvel market. to do everything for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right. Well, um, do you guys have any other topics you want to talk about, or do you want to hit any questions that you've seen pop up in chat before we wrap things up? To be I, the idea guy, you have to have no skills. I, you know, I, I know so many idea guys. I know so, so many people who brag to me about how they're the idea guy with the great ideas, and I, I've gotten past like I've stopped telling people that ideas aren't valuable because it's just a pointless argument. Now I, I've learned that people who latch onto that that idea or that that role um i can't talk them out of it so <laughs> here is something I, I, I've, uh, I've always loved like, that quote it's that your idea is is only worth the value of the paper it's printed on <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, i'm going to say that there is a, a difference in the term idea guy and the actual skill idea guy and there is skill to it it's in conveying actionable things for your idea it's in getting people on board with that idea 
and it's making sure this idea is reasonably achievable. <laughs> like, even if you say this idea isn't so big, but you have no way to tell everyone else what they actually need to get done to make your idea happen, not a good idea, guy. If you have the way to tell them this is what you need to do to get this idea done, it's reasonable. You might be the idea guy, but if people don't want to buy into your idea, is it really portrayed well or is it really good? A good idea guy would be able to say, this is the idea, this is the appeal in it, and this is what I want people to feel when they experience whatever this idea proposes. This is the set of tasks that need to happen in order to get this idea to happen, and they are reasonable. You might be a good idea guy. Very big difference between the title idea guy and the skill. I think yeah, that's I think the quotation also, marks around it. I think there's also a layer <laughs> yeah. of concept. An idea guy can also be a guy who's a good problem solver. Um, yeah. They just they always are able to come up with a solution to something, and that that's also just someone being creative and how to approach a problem. Um, but I guess that's would be more of the implementer uh, mindset, um, or someone who's just really good at at taking a, a an established design or getting something off paper into real world and then learning how to pivot and understand where they can change it based on how the design is set up. That's also to me, someone who is just good at ideas or is super hyper creative being like a top level innovator who can just spout out, you know, philosophical ways to do things or what could be cool, which is, you know, the awesome tagline. Um, if you're not able to back that up in some way to, to your point that like shows that how actionable it would be or get other people behind it, then you're like, you are just saying words. Um, they don't really mean anything. Maybe you'll inspire someone else. You know, that's kind of someone who's like a figurehead or 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 um, something like that. Because um, there's definitely people who have just super creative and, and talented brains, um, but they just have no idea how they're how what they're saying would would become real. Um, but if they do surround themselves with people who can translate what they're saying, then you could an idea person then can be valuable. But they have to recognize that they're just spouting words. I need someone to, to translate those words and turn them into something real. Uh, in my case too, like I, I look at one thing from, if, if we're going to keep using the term ideas guy, is that for me, it's not just about having the idea. It's being able to justify your idea. If somebody says, oh, we should do X and I can, I can say, why? What does that add to the game? Does it make it more fun? Is it, is it going to balance something? Is it going to add more this, that, like, what is the point of your idea? Because um, everyone has ideas about what could go into a project, but Honestly, like there's a lot of research in this. Like I've spent a lot of time learning why you can't have levels a certain way or why this particular way of designing doors or platforms or why there's certain reasons. Like there's rules that you don't have to stick exactly to them, but you have to know why they're there. You have to know why there's balancing rules, why there's level design rules, why there's color theory and all this stuff. So an idea that's just pulled out of your ass might have absolutely no viability if it was implemented. Um, and, and again, we've all done this. When I was younger, I had ideas I wanted to make like a Pokemon style game where you don't control the the animals at all. And then your whole point is you play a Tamagotchi game and then the, they would grow up and fight themselves. And I thought that sounded really cool. It's like, I like AI. AI is a fun thing. But any understanding of game design, you start to realize there's no agency for a player. It's pointless. The game isn't fun if you're not engaged with the process. There's obviously ways to counterbalance that, but you have to know that. You have to know, I need some way to augment the training or work with this or you have to find the gameplay loop for the player so the idea meant nothing it sounded fun because i like ai i like pokemon i like the idea but i didn't know what i was talking about and so ideas aren't just ideas they have to be grounded in understanding and logic of what's being applied <clears throat> yeah and to be fair everybody in the team can be the ideas guy for specific tasks within the game that's being worked on like uh, a combat designer might have a great ideas guy moment where he suggests a new combat mechanic that makes everything flow way better. A level designer can be the ideas guy of how to make a good uh, visually presented level that supports the story and has uh, good mechanics to go with it, et cetera, et cetera. It's not a singular person in any team. Everybody's going to pitch in and everybody has different skill sets where they can say, my idea is credible, here is why, and this is the intent behind it. An idea guy with some idea on what they're talking about. I like that. Succinct. That was a good idea to say that. Thank you. 
<laughs> I have the odd good idea. I'm a good idea guy. I do the idea oh, guy. Oh, man. <laughs> Don't ever do that again. Our games. Oh, I will. Every week. Every week. <laughs> oh, man. It's been fun. Well, um, do you guys have anything else you want to talk about? Or I, I, I have one last thing. I just have a question. When are we going to see Salim's project work? Remember? He was doing his homework. He was doing some game stuff. I, I was, I'm, I'm expecting to see something. I uh, got sidetracked this week because we were going to vacation. So my week was really busy. Um, so unfortunately, I was working a lot of late, late hours. But lo and behold, they actually let us start vacation a little bit early. So next week, I get to double down and catch up on stuff. So yeah. Um, so nice. I, I'm, I'm sad to report that work took precedent, um, but uh, but, but yeah, next happen. couple of weeks I'll be able to actually focus more and uh, and actually get away from work. Hopefully, they gave me some deadlines for the day I get back that I was questioning because that meant that I would basically have to work over the whole day. <laughs> um, but I but I think those are going to get massaged. So can you get the assignment on Friday that's due on Monday? Uh, like, oh yeah, we just need this done by Monday morning. We've got plenty of time. Right? It's been a fun last couple of weeks, that's for sure. Um, yeah, it's, it's. I don't know about everyone else, but last week really flew for me. I had a ton of project work I was finishing up, and then we're we're doing that writing class, and literally, like, it's I'm not even joking when I say it's due Saturday, Friday night. I'm finishing up my day of work, and I look at the clock and go, oh. And then I look at the day and go, oh, no. And I sit there, and I end up having, I just spend like an hour and a half right there and going, if I don't write it now, I won't write it in the morning. So I just wrote the, the quick pitch idea right there. And it's like, yeah, I the, the entire week got away from me. So I can relate. <clears throat> but yeah, hopefully um, I can double down next couple weeks, have some fun. Maybe I can learn how to make an auto battler. With, uh, with or you can just uh, make this level not so crappy looking and get rid of all those extra walls I'm not, I'm and pillars. No, you're better than an artist. You're a game designer. Oh, and that, that was one of the things I wanted to mention real oh, quick. So. God. When it comes to like actually building out levels, you mentioned like have an artist do it, but a lot of the time I see game designers doing oh, a lot of sure. this kind that kind of detail of like let's remove this piece, add these props here and add these pieces here. That it, I just wanted to really quickly get your thoughts on that and maybe um let you share some insight on that with everybody else who hasn't seen that. What's that like if you're doing a level with a team with an artist is what's your normal process for that that and like how much of that is done by designers and it kind of how is that broken out is that something you can just tell people about real quick because i personally i like i find that like i give you a level and it comes back looking fucking awesome and then you might hand it off to an artist and it'll look even cooler but generally like the layout and stuff is already done by you they're just changing up the lighting and the colors and, and doing some extra stuff you're talking to me so, yeah Oh, with you specifically, oh. but I mean, and then with designers in general, like, um, I mean, the notion of level designer is, is it's like the standing question. Is it an artist? Is it a designer? It depends on where you are. Ultimately it just depends on the person's skill. Um, um, but I mean, you know, to your point, like when we did, uh, mighty monster mayhem, like I just built all those levels and put all the kooky stuff in. Um, and then we just had, um, oh, I can't remember his name, but we just had him review that stuff. Um, but ultimately, the, like, you know, from a designer standpoint, it's what story am I telling with my gameplay in this level? Uh, so it makes sense for a designer to do that stuff. Uh, I'm not a level designer by trade. Um, it's just fun to put stuff together and, and see what I can do, um, uh, what cookie stuff comes out of that. Uh, but in the end, I would always just uh, go to an artist um certainly for a visual like am i screwing up you know this is this is you know i've nailed my gameplay flow i think this works well it, it informs the player it tells him where to go it funnels him the right ways um but visually is did i just take a poop on all this um uh, so i would always you know involve people who are more experts at certain aspects of it because um, you'd also get programming um involved in there as well like you know is this performant is this messed up uh, some other way uh, but generally yeah the layout stuff you can see designer do it but you know where i work sometimes it's an artist sometimes it's a it's a designer um sometimes it's very specifically a level designer who's just keeping the communication between designer and artist on a level going and just giving kind of guidelines 
Um, so it really depends on how the studio is run uh, to define that. But in most cases, or in any case, in my opinion, it should just be a level designer um, and whatever their background is, art first, design second, or vice versa. Um, just, you know, you just go with whatever the talent is and then you supplement that with other people. Makes sense. And do you think you need to be an artist to be a level designer or do you just need to be okay at art? Um, I think if you have, if you have artists, um, as a part of your team, I don't think you necessarily need to be an artist to do, to, to be a level designer. I mean, I was designing levels doing paper and pencil RPGs uh, and I mean, you can design a level on a graph paper. You don't need all the visuals. You can describe what is here, give a legend. This is where a trap is, where a torch is, all that type of stuff. And then you can describe what you want to say. But as far as like a 3D medium, um, I don't think you need to be an artist. Um, I think you need to understand some stuff and you need to play games for sure. Um, uh, just to understand the experience. But as far as like the visual part of it, like that's not my, my, not my expertise. I don't think I need to have that necessarily. As long as I can convey at this point, when they turn right here, this is the scene. This is what I want them to see. Um, uh, and then the artist can take that from there. And, and in my opinion, just how I operate, I know a lot of designers who don't operate this way. Um, when I'm asking an artist to make something for me, I want to give them a general concept. This is what I want to see. You are the expert. I want you to have fun with this. I want you to own this. I want you to just get passionate about it. So have fun. Like I'm telling you what I want, go and just have fun. Like, you know, update me on progress, show me what you got, but I want you to get excited about it. There are designers who, when I walk around this corner, I want this exact thing here. This has to be this exact, like you have no, you have no wiggle room as an artist. You just have to do A, B, and C. Um, uh, I think to, to make things more collaborative, you need to give people leeway in their area of expertise as long as they're still meeting what you need from a design standpoint um, for gameplay. Yeah, the, the one caveat I might say to that is there's a difference between someone being particular about it must look the way I want it to look yeah. versus somebody saying this serves a mechanical gameplay purpose. Yes, absolutely. So a level designer might want to first read, which like this blocks that sight line or this has to be that size. Yeah. And so the advice they might give is it has to be this big simply because it has to cover yeah. that sightline or it serves this purpose narratively or something uh, but yeah in general i 100 percent agree the best thing you can do as a project owner or project manager at all is to have people buy into what they're doing if they care about their job they'll do better work every time so if you can give someone ownership of what they're doing they'll enjoy it more and you'll get better work out of them so 100 mm -hmm. percent agree anybody else got thoughts on level design you're all right I just want to say that you're lucky to have level design because I'm in Terraria, then worlds are entirely procedural, and uh, that's absolute hell to both generate <laughs> and uh, check. <laughs> and um, I'll say that many hours were spent just creating worlds and making sure they're okay and trying to find where the goddamn microbiome is in. <laughs> um, but... Uh, when we design them, there is a lot that goes on into uh, choosing what kind of blocks we want to put in what way, uh, how much wiggle room do we want to give the procedural generation when uh, it does its thing. For example, um, if we make a sword shrine, do we always make it the same size? Do we always make sure it has uh, this kind of tunnel at the top that uh, leads you to it? Do we always make sure there are flowers behind? Uh, are there, is there water where it is, et cetera, et cetera. So it's important to have the tools to be creatively uh, free, but uh, it's more important to make sure that you know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and yeah, and, and one thing I've said before, just kind of doubling down on it, is that I cannot stress enough, one of the things people mess up the most, drives me insane, is they'll build something, often in design tools, from camera angles that are not representative of what they're doing. They'll fly the camera up into this, like, god mode view, build a level and go, there, it looks great. And they won't even play the damn thing in first person, if it's a first person game, to see what the hell it looks like. Like, it's crazy. <laughs> and so, a sight line is the most important thing. Like, 
play it with an eye. And that's why I keep him saying, imagine a red laser pointer out of your eye and look at your own experience and watch your eye movement. If you ever catch yourself doing this, because you'll you'll write it off, but it's important. If you do a double take, like you look at something, look back and look again, that's not like something you dodge over. That's like you've highlighted where you yourself as a designer have messed something up. It wasn't visually clear. You couldn't see where it was. You, you got confused. Like make notes of that yourself and course correct. And so I always try to have things visually make sense. They call it a first read. And it's like, make sure the first thing that people see, there's, it's sensible what they're looking at, effectively. So I, I have a question for you, Jason. The uh, For games that let you play third person, action game lets you play third person and first person, uh, do you think that, that, from a level design standpoint, would be supremely challenging? That is tough, yeah. Especially, like, even even model authoring between third and first person can be very different because the actual shape of the model and the level of detail can be vastly different depending on the objectives of, of the angles you're taking. Um, it also depends on the camera, right? That's one of those things where you do, the, you do the white box first, right? So the camera, you'd know, for example, if the camera can zoom out very far, you'll approach it differently than if the camera can only zoom at a certain distance. And then on top of that, you might have a camera which collides with the geometry. And so you might have that issue where the camera can move close or far from objects relative to whether it's clipping versus the kind of camera that clips through terrain. So, yeah, I imagine that could be quite tough for larger scale issues. But I, I would say in most cases, there's like an optimal game play style. Mostly, most like Fallout, for example, it is a first person game. Like you can do third person stuff, but it's a first person game. And so you kind of design around the optimal gameplay experience. And if edge cases occur, that's fine. But I would say it's, you know, pick... Pick the experience you want a person to have. And that's kind of the main takeaway. It doesn't matter about the angle or whatever. Whatever the actual experience the person is going to have, have that yourself. Um, yeah. And this doesn't have to be as obvious as uh, top-down versus first person. I've seen this with people who are making uh, 2D side-scrollers. And they, yeah. will, they will like make their game with the camera zoomed out four times wider than the actual camera of the game. Because it's easier to level design if you're level design with large paint strokes. But then the gameplay itself is going to be a quarter of that. So their own saying, oh, we'll have this shape and it does this. But you don't see any of that shape because the actual camera is a quarter of the zoom in that the real thing is. So you have to frequently check against the actual uh, experience of the game itself. And yeah. uh, some of it depends on the game mechanic as well. If you're going to have a climbing game and stuff like that, you do not want to switch from third person to first person. Yeah. Because it's uh, camera is just a tool to tell a story. Here is a, a neat trick if you're trying to make a first-person level, by the way. You could, uh, if working in Unity, you could make a timeline that travels through the entire level for you, and then you have the first-person line of sight for everything, and you can scrub through and make sure that it all goes to plan um, <clears throat> while you are in your first-person scene view, uh, 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 top-down scene view. Um, also, uh, somebody asked if I have any 2D courses I'd recommend, and I just want to bring it up. 2D is pretty diverse. We we're only talking about the dimension in which you present things. So uh, <laughs> everything has been done in 2D. Um, even the camera is a tool. Yeah. <laughs> the camera is um, a tool. It, like, people talk about 2D, third person, like third person coming off the back or anything. Like the camera is a tool to tell a story. And it should be used that way. Yep. Does it tell your best story? Switching between third person and first person shooters or 2D cameras or whatever. Yeah, you've got to work out what you get. Yeah, the 2D one, there's probably some specific thoughts there. My guess is more on generation or building a platform or something like that. Who knows? Yeah, I mean, um, code for platformers can usually be applied to any kind of type of platformer you want, like 2D, two and a half. Free. Um, doesn't really matter there. The only things I'd really prioritize on 2D are sprite composition and um, ordering. Those are things that you don't get in 3D and you have mm -hmm. to account for them in different ways. So, for example, uh, characters in a 3D game might just clip if they're uh, one behind the, the other. But uh, or, or rather on top of each other. But in 2D, you don't get that. You get a sprite rendering on top of one another. Now, depending on your renderer, this might be actually 3D in the back, and they'll still show this weird Z clipping that happens. Uh, but usually, you'd have full control over it, unless you're running on a game engine that doesn't give it to you. <laughs> um, so in Unity, this is actually something uh, pretty interesting. Uh, they made the 2D render pipeline have specific features just for that. Uh, you can order, um, so 
in general, sprites in Unity have an order number, which would do a good job for most objects. But if they have the same number, Unity now lets you define which axes of position uh, matter more for ordering things. So that's nice. And finally, the hierarchy, of course. And by that, you um, mean you can do like the Y position. If it's higher, we'll go in front if everything else is the same, right? So you can go like further up the screen, goes back type thing. Yeah, and, and this actually matters a lot because depending on the game, you want it in a different way. For example, uh, in an isometric game, uh, characters that are higher up would la are more likely to be behind characters that are lower down because of the fa uh, fake perspective. But in a platformer, characters that are falling down through a fallable platform might actually be in front of um, other entities like that or characters in the air, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, yeah, it's 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 a really nondescript big topic when people say to the aside the whole rendering and order and batching. So, yeah, maybe we should just do a show on the differences between two D and three D development, um, and just kind of call some of those out sometime. It might be interesting, like talk about the differences and the similarities, and some maybe some of the perceived differences that aren't as different as people think too. And then some of the things that are very different, like the Sprite stuff. Yeah. I, I think it would definitely be interesting. I would, What's I would, that? I would, I would watch that show. You would watch that show? Yeah, I yeah. doubt it. Not if you're on it, you won't watch yeah. it. Well, you're like, I don't want to watch that Salim guy. Yeah. I might not hit the like <laughs> button, but you know. Yeah. Speaking of, if you're still watching, please do hit the like button, go share the stream, drop a comment down below and say hello in chat. It definitely helps. And go check out some of the other videos. I just released a video yesterday that's pretty terrible, but it was just random office tech stuff that I thought was really cool. I knew it wasn't going to be very popular, but I've been wanting to share some of those things for a while. So I figured, what the hell? So it's up there. You can go check that out. Um, also, I start to wrap things up. I got a Black Friday sale that's ending today. There's a link down below. There's a timer on there for the next Q&A call, but the sale, I'm going to um, end up killing it today. The codes are starting. They're about to be expired. So getting the free Unity licenses and, and all the other things are going to expire soon. So I'm going to kill that thing. Um, outside of that, I don't know if I had anything else to share other than please tell people to like, subscribe, and yeah, grab the Steampunk Light Switch. Did you guys see the video that I did, by the way? I don't know if any of you guys saw it. Yeah, I did, I did notice that like fifty percent of the stuff you covered are massage based, which is a bit unnerving. But you know. <laughs> they were. Uh, we, we, you we'll have a conversation chair? about that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Did you cover your chair in there? The crazy chair I you have. I did show the massage chair. Yeah, yeah, the one that like I almost just decided to stay at his house forever once he put me in it. <laughs> oh, it's I think it's insane. <laughs> I tell people every time. Every time people come over, they're surprised. I'm like, dude, just get in it, try it out. And they're yeah, like, I, ask me if I use it. I, I literally, I so use bad. that thing every single day. It's the best. <laughs> like, if I'm just going to sit back and chill and watch a YouTube video, a lot of the time what I'll do is, like, I'll, I'll pop something up right on nope. here, some instructional video, and I'll sit in there and watch it until I get to the point where I want to implement it. Then I'm like, pop up, come over here, start implementing it and playing around, and then repeat that <laughs> process. So, I wouldn't even do, do, do that. Do you put your space helmet on when you do that as well? Just to double I do that when I'm not watching a video. So if I'm not going to watch a video and I just want to like pass out, I pop on the space <laughs> helmet. It plays this weird like trancey music oh that makes God. me feel like, I don't know, I'm on acid or something. And it's just passed right out. Like it's it's weird. But it does. It massages your face and head. Oh, and Just so, so you know, uh, I did not experience the space helmet. I would never agree no. to that. You uh, will experience the space I, helmet when you come over next week. Whoa, I experienced so, the, the, the <laughs> chair. The chair was great. I would not watch any videos during that. I would just like close my eyes. I wasn't in the chair. And, you, you, yeah, you missed be that. Done. So I, I just want to verify, but are you in charge of the intervention for this or? <laughs> um, you're right. We're not telling him about the intervention. We're just turning up. <laughs> oh, as long as it's not an RGB intervention, because I've got a whole bunch of panels on my floor that I'm getting ready to uh, pop Dude. up around the around the walls. I'm going to make the whole thing a, a spaceship. I told my wife, but first I told my friend Chris, and then I told my wife that my plan was to turn my office into a spaceship. He said, cool, and but she you don't said, have a workshop. Oh, what the hell? <laughs> You're going to make your, your office a spaceship, but you don't have a workshop. 
He yeah. is. I'm going to use name for me. Yeah, exactly. He's going to just drive down <laughs> here. He's already told me. He sends me the videos. He's like, I'm doing this. What do I do with this? But I'm doing this. And then he's like, I'm turning up. And we're going to just record. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here's the, here's the wires. Here's where they go. Yeah, I, I plan on popping by Dave's house. Maybe when you're here, <laughs> pop over there and be like, Dave, I just need this giant thing built. Yeah. Just need a big display. But it's really cool. The individually addressable RGB LEDs to get like a big oh, display cool. and keep expanding it out. And you just daisy chain them on. And I think it's going to be great for um, it doing some Unity integrations. I, I really want to have like well, a skybox with the sun that goes around the room and stuff. Done it. Given the fact that your two hobbies seem to be glowing lights and things that vibrate, if you're going to be doing personal projects, stick with the lights. I wouldn't really test some uh, personal vibrating toys for the time being. I have a Unity. <laughs> I have vibrating stuff that works for Unity. Yeah. <laughs> Man, we yeah. are getting now. Happy to we introduce are... you to it. It, it. Not that sort of thing. You'll um, see it when, when we go to his house, Salim. You can wait, try wait. out the vibrating did, Unity app. Did you just say you have vibrating stuff that works for Unity? That's what that's works what with I Unity. Guess. Yeah, that's, that's I, I have I have good. vibrating yeah. integrations for Unity. Who <laughs> doesn't? <laughs> you know, you kind of remind now. me of a very uh, interesting bug that I had. Um, <laughs> so Interaya, we <laughs> added uh, we added game part support, <laughs> and when we did the game part support, there was um, a certain amount of interest in getting uh, proper rumble feedback when certain things happen in the game like uh, a boss spawns, roars, and the gamepad would rumble. And when we programmed the first implementation of it, there was a problem because the implementation with XNA, at least, uh, didn't want to play nicely. So it kind of made the uh, gamepad rumble endlessly until it ran out of a battery that we could not take out. And that was the weirdest time I ever had to deal with uh, hardware issues. <laughs> Just an endlessly rumbling gamepad, and there's nothing you can do to kill it. I've I've done that before, not not to that extreme. I was able to pop my batteries out. <laughs> oh, the yo-yos chat. All right. Well, anybody got any last last second things to share other than your eyes yo-yos? Yeah, <laughs> which I are was... the Terraria yo-yos that we were talking about. Did we? Was that that was off stream, right? Uh, uh, I think, I uh, I, no, was it? No, no, that was. Was that was that live? The the crazy killer. I think after the golf. Talking about right? that right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. I think I'm gonna get one from from my niece because she loves Terraria so much. So and maybe introduce her to yo-yoing. <clears throat> I have a uh, Moonlord one, and it bumped into my nose way more times than I'd like to admit. <laughs> 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 yo-yoing is hard, and it's even harder when it's in my name. <laughs> Dangerous. <huh? laughs> All right. Well, anybody got any last second uh, words before we say goodbye to everybody? Uh, other than yeah. please hit the thumbs up button, subscribe, and share the stream. Yeah. So I was going to put out a poll, but it turns out I can't put out a poll for another week because there's some weird Unity community things. So I'm just going to chuck a, a tutorial video out straight after this. Oh, Thanks. awesome. So we'll go live. Uh, Actually, everybody, make I'll, sure that you. I'll do it right now. Subscribe to Dave's oh. channel right now, and I will post the link in chat, and we'll put it in the top of the description too, so you can just jump over and go check it out. What's this video going to be about? I uh, this video is a tutorial on having an argument with Unity. Having an argument, an argument with <laughs> Unity. Yep, having arguments with Unity. All right, let's see. Let's get that link up. Got the link right here. I'm going to drop it in chat. Hopefully, that's <laughs> what it is. There it goes. It went live. Yeah, so having an argument with Unity. People right. can decode it's... that. They'll know what it means. <laughs> <laughs> having arguments with Unity. All right, it is live, and it's got its first like already. I'm going to go watch that after. I'll after watch it before you it like it. No, I always hit like first and then do it. So that way, <laughs> if, I, if, I, if I really don't like the video by the end, I, I can uncheck the like button. Yeah, but I won't yeah, forget true. to hit like at the beginning. I just hit it, watch, and then decide mm -hmm. if it's really worth unchecking. <laughs> I'll let you know if I. I, I get to it now. It. Took me a second. I knew where you were going. <laughs> <laughs> you get it? Yeah, nice one. Yeah, I thought you would. Cool. So everybody, please go check that out. Make sure that you subscribe. We got five hundred and one subscribers. Oh, and I just got all alerts on. Why was it unpersonalized? All right, and all alerts are on. So now we can go check that out. 
and uh, I'm sure it's going to be funny and interesting. All right. Well, thanks again, everybody, for coming out. It, it will be funny, Dave. Okay. <laughs> um, it, it, yeah. Any anything else? Or is that it? We say goodbye. Okay. All right, goodbye, everybody. Please hit subscribe, Bye. share, check out the links, the Everyone courses, have all a that. Happy stuff. holidays. And yes, Merry Christmas. Your happy holidays, holidays, everyone. First one to remember. Yes. And, and remember, <laughs> don't eat yellow snow. Well, <laughs> speaking of, have Trump you guys Trump. seen the new South Park movie? No, the post. The second part, I guess. Go watch it. Oh, after, after the stream, I'd say go watch it. It was worth watching hey. if you liked any South after, Park. After movie. watching David's video. <laughs> Oh, yes. love you. Yes. Do you work? The video and then watch the new South Park. You work. All right. For, goodbye, for everybody. Comedy Central now or something? What is this? What? Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, we're going to be sponsored by Comedy yeah, Central. Sponsored. Yeah. Dave Chappelle. <laughs> going to pop on. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, yeah. All right. But South Park was definitely good. Check it out. All right. Goodbye, everybody. I'll see y'all right. soon. Um, see y'all, I guess, uh, next week. Is next week a holiday? Someone said it's uh, Barney. It's the day after Christmas. That'll be a fun yeah, one. We'll do a Christmas review. All right. See everybody later. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>